I was hiking deep in the Smoky Mountains National Park with my best friend, Bill Johnson. He was a nature-loving tree hugger, and so was I. Since I was a boy growing up in eastern Tennessee, I had spent every free second I could out in the wilderness, climbing trees and hiking as deep into the forest as I could. I got a park management and environmental studies degree so I could join the wildlife services as a park ranger, and after several years of scraping and slaving, got my dream job as a ranger in the Smoky Mountains National Park, the most beautiful, idealistic place in the world, in my opinion. Life was absolutely perfect. It was a dream come true. That opinion has since changed. After the incident, I can't find myself appreciating nature anymore. I've even gone so far as to eagerly join a logging company that is attempting to tear these forests down, converting these forests down, converting these forests to supermarkets and parking lots is now giving me the same joy I once felt hiking through them. But if you saw what I went through, would you blame me? Like I said, it all began three months ago. I had several days off, which I planned on doing my favorite leisure activity, hiking. I planned to undertake a multiple-day excursion up the Appalachian Trail. My best friend and fellow nature nutbill eagerly agreed to join. It was a simple matter of packing. I already knew what to take. Several days' provisions, emergency equipment, tent, and sleeping bag, all stored neatly in a hefty backpack. Bill, not quite being the expert I was, took a wee bit longer, but eventually we met together at the Appalachian Trailhead to begin our excursion. Then we simply began. Like always, it was like stepping into paradise. Just me, the forest, the soothing, peaceful quiet, only interrupted by Bill's insipid chattering. Gee, I hope I haven't forgotten anything. Hey! What's that red bird by that tree? Hey, I think I see a river otter over there. I silently grinned, pointing out the various flora and fauna to Bill's excited eyes. Bill, while loving nature like his very own son, wasn't exactly the brightest when it came to most matters of nature. He just admired it for what it was, preferring to experience nature rather than study up on it. Luckily, he had me with him. I loved teaching Bill as much as he loved learning about it, even if his talk did scare away most of the wildlife before we even had a chance to see it. At least I don't have to worry about bears. Several blissful hours passed. Bill's talking was gradually replaced with huffing and wheezing, but even that didn't stop the occasional comment or excited quip. He didn't even notice as I tuned him out, preferring to look around in silence. I was quite adequate at this having endured Bill's conversation on dozens of other hikes. Suddenly, as my mind was lost in the abject beauty of the forest, something he said caught my ears. Uh, hey, Jack, I think you, uh, should look at this. The tone of his voice set me off. It sounded fearful, completely unlike the perky, cheerful person I knew. My fears were only confirmed when I looked in Bill's direction. It was a doe. But something was wrong. It was completely still, staring at us in a clearing from about 15 yards away. Something was definitely off about the creature. It wasn't moving one inch. No ears twitched. No head shifted. No tail flicked. But the most unsettling thing was by far the eyes. They were completely white, with no pupil at all. Dark red, dried blood trickled down from the sockets. The fur was matted and scruffy and completely filthy and caked with dried blood. It was obvious the deer had been dead for days. Yet it was still upright, standing perfectly still, as if someone had taxidermized the poor creature right there on the spot. And was it my imagination, or was the skin rippling as if something was just underneath? Bill instantly trotted forwards for a closer look. I shot a warning glare at him, which was ignored. He didn't even look in my direction as he approached the deer. As I cautiously approached closer, 
I heard a gasp followed by a panic scream. In a split second, the deer burst, spilling out hundreds of tiny, brightly colored spiders into the air from inside its boated carcass. Bill immediately took up running, and I instantly began sprinting back towards the trail. In a minute, we both arrived at the trail and sprinted back down, dashing several hundred feet before finally stopping. Bill puffed and wheezed, and even my naturally fit body was complaining from the sudden sprint. What was that? he gasped, clutching his stomach. What were those things? I was at a complete loss. I had never seen a spider like those before. Even my vague glimpse of them confirmed they were a completely new species. The coloration was completely unnatural for any known species of spider. Ah, uh, I... I was jolted from my thoughts by the white-hot scream from Bill. Apparently one of the spiders had made it onto my friend's arm, sinking its jaws deeply into his exposed flesh. For a precious minute, I managed to examine the spider. It was captivatingly hideous, about an inch wide and half the size of Bill's freaking hand. It was predominantly red, with some black and blue markings streaking its face and sides. But the most intriguing trait was the ninth eye. On its head, the spider had the normal eight eyes for a spider, but on its abdomen was a giant ninth eye taking up the entire top portion of the abdomen. It resembled a human eye to a haunting degree with an iris and a pitch-black pupil that was staring directly up at Bill's terrified face. Bill instantly moved to swipe off the hideous creature from his arm, but then his gaze met the spider's ninth eye, and he paused, confused. I shivered as the eye seemed to bore into Bill's very soul, the poor man freezing up completely as if paralyzed, eyes locked onto the spider's terrible gaze. I myself was locked out of my own little trance by a scuttling sound behind me. I turned around and gasped in utter terror. The forest floor was alive. Hundreds, possibly thousands of spiders, were scurrying all along the floor, marked in dazzling hypnotic colors like a rainbow. They all had eyes, giant humanoid eyes that lined their backs and every single eye was locked at Bill's face. When my trance was broken, so was Bill's. He took one look at the spiders and screamed in utter raw terror. He tried to move, but he couldn't. He was completely paralyzed by both the spider's gazes and whatever venom the first spider had pumped into his blood. I tried to pull him along, but he wouldn't even budge. It was like his body was made of stone, only his face turning towards mine with a silent, pleading look of fear. The scurrying behind me grew louder, and I turned backwards, glancing at the demonic eyes one more time. Instantly, I turned away in terror. I couldn't do it. A split-second glimpse of those deadly, inhuman eyes was like staring into the gates of hell itself. If those demonic gazes were aimed at you, you were as good as dead. Luckily, or rather unfortunately, those gazes weren't directly aimed at me. They were locked onto Bill, who by now had turned towards his fate one more time. I ran. I couldn't help it. I was powerless to do anything but run. My flight instinct had kicked in, leaving poor Bill to die. I looked behind me as I fled at Bill, staring directly into the eyes of the spiders, into the eyes of death itself. He let out another scream, this time a high-pitched, despairing wail that only creatures sealed with a stamp of death could possibly utter. A scream of fear, a scream of pain, and a scream of hate for both his aggressors, and of me for abandoning him. Then the spiders reached him, crawling all over his body like a flood. Their eyes were all locked into his head, staring so intently that I would swear that they were feeding into his very soul. Bill's body spasmed and collapsed into the wave of spiders, eyes rolling back into the same dead whiteness that I had saw just minutes before in the deer. Blood sputtered from within as the spiders tore inside, violently attacking their new source of food. Bill let out another remorseful, agonizing howl, even more inhuman than before. 
It even managed to match the demonic glare of the spiders, as if the spiders themselves were singing instead of him. Then he and the spiders disappeared into the trees as I sprinted down the trail, faster than I ever had before. The agonizing cries of despair and raw pain faded into the woods as I fled, ditching my backpack in favor of more speed. I thought I would never make it. Luckily, even as night fell, I found myself at peace, surrounded by the naked woods and being reassured by the lively sounds and chirps of the local wildlife. I knew these trails by heart, so I managed to eventually find my way to the trailhead, pull myself to the car, and drive to the medical center before passing out in the curved entryway. I awoke in the hospital. Overall, physically, I was unscathed other than severe exhaustion. Nevertheless, I stayed and recovered in the hospital, watching as they recovered my old friend's body in the same condition as the deer. Standing upright, still as a corpse, bloodshot, dead eyes caked with blood and devoid of any internal organs. The spiders inside had apparently vanished, though. I never enjoyed nature again. Like I said above, I quit my job as a park ranger and began working for a logging company as a logger and guide, my expertise of the area proving invaluable. Despite my newfound enjoyment, I do this job for another reason. The loud buzzing of the saws against wood is the only thing that ever manages to drown out the agonizing, inhuman wails of my dying friend that still echo in my mind every day. Plus, it pays more. The other day, while working, we found a co-worker standing dead still, caked with blood and dead as a doorknob. The spiders have claimed another victim. Like Bill, the spiders had disappeared but they'll be back. Please don't go hiking anymore. And I don't know how many spiders are out there. No one else has even discovered them yet, and they're not just limited to the Smokies. Bodies in an identical state have been discovered as far west as Northern California, although the casualty rate is so far low. And most of all, watch out for the ninth eye. Even as I'm typing this, I can see it. Right outside my window is a single spider. Its demonic eye is staring right at me, and even worse, it's more human now than before. In fact, it resembles one very familiar eye in particular. Bill is staring at me from the window. So I'm a ranger who lives and works in a remote park in Queensland in Australia. I heard a knock on my door late at night last year, a young man from Brisbane, about a 14-hour dry away, was standing at my door. He was scared, a bit pale and a bit shaken, transpired that he had been camping at one of my campsites, heard grunting and snarling, and they ran to the car next to his tent and drove the 30 kilometers to my house. It is a very steep, rough clay and winding four-wood road down to my house. I don't like driving it at night at the best of time, let alone when it is drizzling with rain. After he explained the noises and grunting, I told him that he had run away and risked his life because of a male kangaroo that was trying to get it on with its girl. And I said, welcome to the bushmate. Not a park ranger, but I've seen some wacky shit up near Lake Powell. Two come to mid, though. The last time I was there, I was out fishing with my dad on our little boat, chilling in some little cove. I hear a noise, look up, and a giant ass plane flies right over us. Couldn't have been more than 400 feet above us. I couldn't get any pictures or video, and I couldn't recognize the plane at all. Different trip. I was probably seven or eight years old, riding in the front of my dad's truck while he is driving us back as usual. It was like three in the morning. I was about to pass out when I see a big shadow dart across the road. What the hell was that? I sure as hell don't know. My dad also makes a noise and surprise, and we both just kind of sit there. He asks, you see that too? Yeah, I sure as hell did. 
We both look back out to the road and see two bright yellow eyes off in the bushes up ahead of us. We didn't go under 60 until we reached Flagstaff. I spent a lot of time growing up in the mountains of northern Arizona. I've posted this before, but don't mind posting it again. Me and three friends went out late one night. I must have been 16 or 17. We would often go in deep parts of the forest and smoke weed and hang out. This time around, we decided to go to a random spot, out way past where we were used to going. We were probably a good 10 miles out from an area called Doney Park in Flagstaff and found a spot super far into the woods where we could build a fire and smoke some bowls. Two of my friends hopped out of the vehicle to take a pee while me and the other friend stayed in the car. We sat in silence for a short time before we heard tree branches snapping in the loudest crackling sound imaginable. Sounded just like the predator. We looked at each other with absolute fear and confusion in our faces. Our other two friends hopped into the car almost simultaneously, and we all freaked the fuck and started driving back to the road. While driving through the forest, we hit maybe 50, 60 on dirt roads, and we still heard branches breaking and the crackling. I was afraid for my life that night, but we finally made it back to the road and decided to call it short that night as we were all too afraid to go back into a wooded area and smoke. I've had every denier tell me what animal it was or could have been, but after researching it for years, I still have yet to come across that sound coming from any known animal native in Flagstaff, Arizona. It was truly bone-chilling. On the other side, I've spoken with natives, and the answers have been mixed. I've had answers from Wendigo to Skinwalker, even witches. A lot of spooky shit happened to me in the woods before. I even heard drums that came closer and closer after stopping in between, and eventually one loud one banged right in front of us. The scariest thing is, I was never alone for either of these. It involved multiple people who can retell the story word for word on how it happened. There is something strange going on in the woods of northern Arizona. I am 28 now, and this still gives me chills to this day. Not a ranger, but... I came across some poor woman at Arches National Park who was stuck in the middle of the road because her car was struck by lightning. It wouldn't turn on or budge. I offered to pull her to a more safe location, but she couldn't even shift the vehicle into neutral since it wouldn't start. It took a good half hour to find a ranger to tell them because there's no cell service or phones in the park. I don't know what happened to her. I hope she was okay. In 1982, I was a seasonal firefighter from the Modoc National Forest. It's extreme in northeastern California, rather remote, kind of near the Oregon border, up near Klamath Falls Lava Beds National Monument. Anyway, small four, man fire crew and the boss. He lived in a little trailer adjacent to our old cabin, right on Medicine Lake. There had been this Native American fella that had been hanging around for weeks, experienced with firefighting and whatnot. He kept thinking he could get on the crew. But the protocol was such that you had to do it all in advance. And we had our little crew, all four of us, and there was no chance he could be on it. But he kind of wouldn't take no for an answer. This was the U.S. Forest Service Department of Agriculture Forest Service Small Fire Crew. So we're all familiar with this fella. Can't remember his name anymore, and, you know, we're up early in the morning doing the... They call them the Pete's physical exercise and all. Getting ready for the day, and he's up with us, again, trying to join us. And he goes, hey, look what I found here. And he takes us out to the edge of Medicine Lake, and there's this huge footprint, but just one. It must be 18 to 20 inches long, 6 inches wide, and it's like... Okay, and then we're all. Where's the next one? But, yeah. 
The next one was down on the swampy edge of the lake. So that kind of made sense, you know, that there was only one odd as that was. And the boss there, the crew boss, he says, boy, this is strange, fellas, just last night. Sometimes he'd have his little four-year-old up there spending the night in his trailer. He goes, my son woke me up in the middle of the night saying, daddy, daddy, Bigfoot's out there. He just brushed it off until a couple hours later. There was a print, and it caused enough interest. Everyone who was pretty skeptical, I think. It caused enough interest. We called the Big Cheese the District Ranger, they call him. An hour and a half away at Two Lake, he comes up. An hour and a half up, four. We'll drive pretty rough roads, you know, one way up like that. He comes up and he's quite interested. He's trying to take a print of it, a plaster cast. I'm watching him do this, and when I was a kid growing up, I did this stuff all the time. I'm watching. I'm thinking like that's not gonna work because it was too watered down. But I was like almost a kid. I was in my young 20s. One of my first big jobs of that nature, which I continued doing. You know, most of my working life, I was like, I was too intimidated to say to the big boss man, you know, the district ranger, hey, you're screwing it up, pal. Put more plaster there, whatever it is, which is exactly the case. He failed to get a copy. When I was a kid, probably seven or eight, I was out dirt biking in the woods with my dad. These were trails through a nature preserve that were approved for dirt biking and such, but the forests are protected. Well, we come across these two sketchy-looking characters logging in the woods super illegally. They're in the trail, and we stop, and they stop, and they start talking to us, telling us about how it's their uncle's land, and they just got out of jail and were logging it. We knew it was illegal, but didn't really want to bring up what they obviously knew hole out in the middle of the woods. After a few minutes, one of the guys stops, looks at us, and goes, man, it's kind of like deliverance out here, isn't it? My dad gave me the look, and we immediately ripped out to there. Watching horror films as a kid pays off. One time I was solo camping on Crown Land in Ontario. This is out in the middle of nowhere. Nobody around for miles type, nowhere. So nighttime rolls around, and I'm in my tent, just laying there, enjoying the quiet. All of a sudden, I heard loud footsteps coming around my sight, near where I had my fire pit dug. I figured it was a bear or a moose, because they're definitely around the area. Suddenly, I get a whiff of cigarette smoke, unmistakable smell of cigarette smoke in the nice, clean woods, nighttime air. I hop out of the tent with my shotgun in hand, and there's some guy snooping around my belongings. He doesn't seem surprised or scared. He says, oh, and just walks away. I don't know who he was, what he wanted, or where he came from. Like this area is middle of Alaska-type wilderness. I didn't sleep that night, and I packed up out, headed out break of dawn. In March 2021, I woke up in the middle of the night and went downstairs to check on my pet Irish setter. It was dark in the living room when I got there. Every light in the house was off except for the electric night lights all around the perimeter of the downstairs and upstairs, so you can easily see things while walking around in the dark. My house is kind of small and next to a few large local trailer parks. To my surprise, when I got downstairs, my dog was awake in its crate and looking up at a huge nine-foot-tall hunched-over dogman. The terrifying thing was towering up to the ceiling and was so tall that it was hunched over just to fit in the living room by our Pete's crate. I am six-foot-two inches tall and skinny, but even I had to tilt my neck upward just to look up at it. My dog was awake staring straight up at it. I never keep my dog in the crate, but sometimes my family snatches him from me and puts him in there. 
Anyway, this nasty-looking cryptid had strange feet and stood only on its tiptoes. It was not flat-footed like people are. It was impossible for a person to stand this way, which made me shudder. The thing had very little fur on its body, but really only had a giant mane of hair from its head, neck, and upper back downward. The hair was super long, too, but the rest of its body lacked hair. This is why I mentioned mole. Rats in my previous post, even though these creatures are obviously not related. Its arms were outstretched to its sides extremely far as well, because it obviously had no idea what it was like to be in my house before. It must have had to feel the walls of the small house with its arms just to move around. The arms were too long and far stretched out to even be a person in an outfit. It was obviously downstairs for a while, making noise, trying to eat my pet. This explains why I woke up out of nowhere like that. What was scariest was that the dogman was standing there practically frozen in time, looking at me with ears pointing straight up. It was processing my location and was slowly moving toward me. At first, when I saw it, it was stunned and did not want to move, but when I got closer to it, it started slowly moving toward me, and I panicked hardcore, as anyone would. Its face was the nastiest, most gnarly thing ever. Huge, elongated snout when it turned its head suddenly. It looked like something with nasty rabies or mange, and that tells me it was underground for a while, struggling or starving. Its teeth were grossly sharp. I ran as fast as possible, bumping into walls, over and over, with it breathing loudly while I was yelling at the top of my lungs in terror. I was falling in my socks, too, while trying to climb the stairs to wake up my relatives. My dog was just listening to everything at that point, and he hardly made noise because he was obviously shaken, too. When I got to my mom, she woke up screaming, too, and called the police while hiding in a room. I booked it back downstairs with some blades to find the living room empty. Then I realized it could have been in any room in my small home, such as the kitchen, bathroom, or basement. So I booked it out the front door in the night, knowing that my mom was safe with her husband barricaded in a room, with them both yelling. I informed them in time that something was downstairs. I figured with quick thinking that all of us yelling probably could scare the thing away as you would do when encountering a bear or wolf in the woods. I booked it out of the front door and walked about ten miles in the night with bare necessities I could grab in time. I was terrified and only had blades. I am a 26-year-old felon and I am not allowed to own or carry firearms. I walked away like this because I did not want to find the thing unexpectedly in my house in some random room that I did not check, such as the basement or bathroom. I was just happy to be gone and alive while the cops checked everywhere for the giant intruder. I've been in cuffs a bunch of times. Two, I do not trust cops anyway unless they're just with my mom and her husband. I got lucky. After all, I was more familiar with my house than the dogman was. Anyway, the best part for last, when I got back home, a large glass window, which was approximately five feet tall and four feet wide, was completely shattered. The thing obviously had a direct line of sight from our large backyard into my kitchen and living room. They'd clay where the dog slept, and my family thought it was me that broke the window. Turns out that the dogman tore through our house from this one glass window. I had to yell at my family for about a year until my mom and brother admitted they were wrong and that the thing obviously existed. Finally, my dog does not run into the night anymore when I open the door of the house. One of the accounts that I recently heard while listening to YouTube nearly caused me to crash my car. It was a story about the sighting of a large humanoid creature wearing what appeared to be a black cloak with an owl's face in the central Florida area. Talk about a heart-stopping moment. Here is my encounter with a similar entity. It was an afternoon in late May this year, 2020. One. I remember it was later in the afternoon, early evening, but it was a slightly overcast and gray day, so I can't tell you from memory if it was dusk or earlier. 
I live near a nature conservation area in the central Florida area. My husband and I were very fortunate to find our property, ample acreage heavily wooded to the point where we could not see our neighbors or any lights from their home. We lovingly call our home the swamp. I was outside in our driveway, which is the only cleared space on our land, save for a natural circular clearing in our woods. I was walking back to our porch when, for some reason, I was compelled to turn and look back to the tree line, around 80, 100 feet away from the house. I do want to note that there was not a single ounce of fear in me. In fact, I was quite calm when I made eye contact with it. At first, I didn't register what I was looking at. I knew it was an owl, which for my woods is not an uncommon sighting. But then it kind of shifted and I saw more of it. It was not just an owl, it was the head of an owl, and what I can only describe is the shoulders of a human, and it looked like it was wearing a dark cloak, either made of dark cloids or feathers. It was tall, and from the trees around it, I guessed around seven feet or so. It just looked at me, and I looked at it. I looked around and blinked, sincerely thinking it was a trick of the lighting, or my mind creating a thing where there was nothing. But no, when I looked back, it was still there, calm and unmoving. I was still unafraid, which is not normal for me as I can freak myself out easily. For some reason I felt another urge, this time to nod. I nodded towards it like I was showing my acknowledgement of it. It felt natural and right to do so, then turned and went inside my home. I did not go back outside that day, but the next morning I went back outside and stood in the same place on my porch to look at what it may have been, and there was nothing I could even remotely try to place as it. The space where it stood was between two trees at the opening to the forest line, leading back to the small clearing. There were no low-hanging branches, no large leaves, no anything that I could trick myself into believing that was what I had actually seen. I have not seen it since then. I did some mild searching on the internet, but found nothing even remotely close to it, so I just let it go. Until today, when I heard that story about an hour ago now. Does anyone know what this might be? Has anyone else in the Central Phil area, or anywhere, seen anything like this? First, here is some backstory. For the biggest part of my life, I lived in Greece, and I recently moved to Canada. In Greece, we don't have tales of skinwalkers or any other sinister being so... If I say something incorrect, it's probably because I lack information and knowledge. I started riding my motorcycle to Ontario at around 10 p.m., a seven-hour trip from where I lived. Roughly halfway through the trip, I guess at around 1 a.m., the fuel tank was empty. Now I need to note that I was sure I had a full tank before leaving. So this was very weird. I called 911 since I didn't know who to call at that point, and the dispatcher said that although I shouldn't call for this kind of issue, she'd send someone to help me. I apologized and thanked her. The place I was stopped was a straight road with trees on each side. A forest. I was near French River Provincial Park. When the conversation ended, I noticed something extremely weird. Silence. Extreme silence, as if everything around me had died. The crickets that were previously getting on my nerves had stopped. The owls were nowhere to be heard. Then I heard a dog crying from inside the woods. It was extremely distinct, since it was the only thing I could hear. Since I love dogs, I slowly and hesitantly started making my way inside the woods to see if that dog was hurt. I was approaching. I could hear the crying louder with each step. Then I stopped. The crying was now taking place in front of me. But then it stopped, and instead of crying, the sound that I could hear now was an aggressive growl behind me. I turned around and saw it. It was not a dog, not a wolf, not a bear. In fact, it wasn't anything animal-like. It was a seven-something-foot tall thing with a dog face and extremely sharp teeth. I literally crapped my pants. My survival instinct kicked in, and I immediately started running back to my motorcycle. 
I was crying as a result of being so terrified. I finally made my way back to the road and saw a fire truck and two firefighters. They asked me if I was okay, but I couldn't say a word. I was shivering. When I was finally able to talk, I told them everything. They said that this was a common thing there and that rangers had been looking for that thing for more than a decade. They checked my bike and when they looked at the tank, they saw claw marks all over it and spilled fuel. They took me with them and helped me with my motorcycle. I am completely traumatized and I still can't explain what I saw. That's the reason I share this story with you. To see if anyone else had any similar experiences. I was recently driving late at night in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. I lived 30 miles south of Alamosa, Colorado. I was driving on a back road with my buddy taking him home near my house. It was about 12 a.m. Out of nowhere, this thing appeared in the headlights in the middle of the road. It was crouching over some roadkill. It was humanoid. It was pale and looked like it had no ears. It looked like a wendigo from until dawn. It was seven feet tall with abnormally long arms. No nose and nasty teeth. It wasn't skinny, but its skin was tight with ribs visible with long claws on the end of its hands. I was barely able to dodge it with my truck as I was driving considerably fast. As I swerved around it, it seemed like time slowed down. It looked up from the roadkill. It was eating and stared at me as I passed. Its eyes were yellow. I immediately hit the brake and yelled at my friend WTF. Did you see that? His eyes were wide with fear, and he nodded at me. I threw the truck in reverse, but when I approached the roadkill, it was gone. My friend claims to have seen it too, so I know I'm not crazy. When I was a kid, I read a lot of stories about the rake. I know the rake isn't real, so maybe they invented a creature that already existed. Maybe it's a cave creature, like in The Descent. I need answers. This happened in 2005. I used to be a garbage man. So in 2005, I used to have a garbage route over in Indiana in Dearborn County. It was a state route that ran parallel to the Ohio River. So this one morning, it's just before sunlight, but it's enough light where just before dawn, you know, just enough light so it's not dark. I'm dumping some trash, and I look, something's catching my eye a quarter mile up the road. I hear a deer running out of the clearing coming towards the road. So I'm looking at him I've hunted before, so I know what it looks like when a deer is being driven. As it approaches this state route, it's not so much busy, but it's like a 60-mile-per-hour route, so traffic, when it comes, comes fast. So these deer, when they get to the road, they cross the road with no regard for traffic. So I think they're more scared of whatever is chasing them than getting hit by a car. So I'm looking at the deer, and out of the corner of my eye again, I see the trail of deer and I see something coming out of the woods chasing it, and you know how. When you see things that you don't know, your mind tries to rationalize what you're seeing. So I'm seeing this. Huh? Huge black creature chasing this deer, and I'm like, okay, that's a bear. But bear don't run on two feet. So just as they get to the edge of the road, it swipes and clips the back of this deer and sends it like, like a helicopter. It knocked this deer clear across the road. I'm still dumping trash in the way this road is. It's kind of an undulating road, so it's just over a rise, and I can see maybe waste up what's going on. So it takes me uh, maybe about five or ten more minutes to work a couple more trash stops to come over that rise and see. So I pull over to the side of the road, and I see a fat dead deer with his neck twisted like a dish towel. The neck had been broken, and one of its hindquarters was missing, like a Thanksgiving turkey. Like how you would just take a turkey's leg, except it had taken the hindquarters out of the socket like it was a turkey leg. You know what? I'm very into nature. 
and I'm mad at myself because if I had the understanding and I knew what I was watching, I mean, I had one of those. What do they call it? A life altering experience, and I'm mad that I couldn't appreciate it because my mind dismissed it as being something else. It just goes to show you, believe what you see. Just because you don't hear about something or you don't believe it, believe your eyes. My sighting occurred southeast of our cabin near Danbury, Wisconsin. The cryptid was very wolf-like, and it definitely was not a bear. As well as I'm pretty sure wolves don't run upright. So I was 17 at the time. It was midsummer, and we were at our cabin in northwest Wisconsin. I was with my cousin and grandparents for the weekend. I brought along my airsoft gear. So I and my cousin are in a mid-airsoft battle. I took it more seriously than him. I was decked out in full BDU woodland camo, including the Shima. I retreated into the forest for better tactical advantage. So the way our land was set up is there is a trail that cuts around the border of the almost acre of owned forest. Our skirmish took us about 200 meters into the woods going up the right trail. So I'm a huge outdoorsman. I was introduced to hunting and survival training as well as firearms at a young age. I also had been practicing MMA for a few years at that point. The point is, I'm not easily scared, and I'm comfortable in the wild. Now, I'm 25 and have even more training. I respect the wild a lot more now. I was cocky back then. Anyway, here is where things get strange. Our battle had ended, and we were standing at the edge of a slightly clearer area of forest and just talking. On the other side of the clearing is a hill that goes down to a small pond. Animals are a common sight around there as it's a watering hole. Now, as any experienced outdoorsman will know, most small animals will go about their business. Even when humans are around, birds will still chirp and whatnot. But when a big predator is around, the forest goes dead quiet. So me and my cousin are talking, and I decided to freak him out. So I shushed him and whispered, we're being watched. He got quiet. Then I realized that it was dead quiet, not even birds chirping anymore. Then I got that feeling. You know, when you feel like you are being watched. I went into hunter mode at this point and started scanning the clearing. I went from right to left, then back. On the second look through, I saw it. Its teeth are what gave it away as they contrasted with the background. Once I focused on it, I noticed a kinid appearance in the head. It had dark reddish-brown hair of fur. Where it gets even stranger is it was leaning on a tree and had its front left arm gripping the tree. It appeared to have claws, and it was panting and staring in our direction with its ears up listening while kneeling or crouching. I recognized it as a threat, as a predator, immediately. Now this all happened in the span of maybe ten seconds before I said to my cousin, we have to go. He was a faster runner than me. When I said that I was still watching the animal, my cousin took off. When he ran, the animal raised up and ran towards us. It took a good three steps on two legs before I started to run, as I was turning to run. It appeared to have possibly been going to all fours. I got to the fork in the trail to find my cousin waiting. I yelled, go, go! and we ran back to the cabin. While running out, I could hear it crashing through the woods behind me, but it didn't follow beyond the tree line. At the time, I thought it had the intention to do harm, but now that I look back on it, I think it was just being either territorial or it was a bluff charge. Most animals can easily outrun humans on foot. If it really wanted one of us, it would got us. I have tried to explain it away as being a bear or a big wolf, but what I saw just does not add up. It just wasn't a known animal. I'm still stumped by it. I was recently added to a group of people who have had similar sightings. They say mine falls in line with other sightings. They believe it to be a dogman, which I think is the cheesiest name they could have chosen. But I admit that what I saw is very similar, if not the same, as what others have claimed to see. I have different theories regarding the creature, though. I am normally very skeptical, 
However, I know that what I saw was not normal, and I am less skeptical than I used to be now. I am still nervous about the forests. I don't go into the woods alone or unarmed anymore. I'm not scared of any man, but I certainly don't want to see anything that looks like a werewolf again. By the way, all of this happened in broad daylight if it wasn't clear. I'm going to start off by saying that this post is completely legitimate. This is not fiction. This is something real that I have experienced. My hope for sharing this experience on the internet is that I can find someone else who has witnessed the same thing as me, or something similar, as I have been searching for answers for years. Also, maybe someone can give me some insight on what this could be. I don't expect anyone to truly believe what I'm writing. I know it is unbelievable, but I know my truth. This experience is something that changed my life completely. Also would like to note that during my life I have had lots of paranormal and spiritual experiences. I don't consider myself a religious person, but I believe in God. I've witnessed too many miracles and things not to believe. When I had this experience I was 18. I am now 22. One night years ago I was hanging out with my now ex-boyfriend. It was either November or December of 2019. We decided that night that we wanted to look at the stars. It was very cold out and probably around 1 a.m., but that didn't ever stop us from going outside. We put on extra layers, grabbed a blanket, and laid out to look at the stars. Most of the night we were having fun laughing and taking. There was one point where our conversation got very serious. He started explaining to me that he didn't believe in God or anything at all. He believes nothing will happen when we die. My response to that was, I respect his beliefs, but I believe in God. I know something will happen when we die. I've witnessed too many spiritual things in my life not to believe. I've always had a knowing that something more is out there. His only response was once he sees something, he'll believe it. We were quiet for a while after that, but eventually continued talking about other things and having fun. That's when I saw something in the sky. What I saw was a massive pair of wings gliding directly above me. It was at least 18, 20 feet. I couldn't make out a head, legs, or tail. Just a massive pair of wings. It was dark and hard to see, but the wings had a subtle glow, just enough for me to see it. It almost looked see-through, but also glowing. Can't be for sure, though. It was a shocking thing to see. I wasn't necessarily horrified, but I was in complete awe. I didn't feel anything negative. My ex wasn't paying attention at first. I shouted at him too, look up. When he did, he immediately started panicking. He was swearing and freaking out. The pair of wings wasn't there for long. It just flew above us, then above my house and seemed to disappear or just faded into the darkness. As it was flying, it only flapped its wings once. So really, it was gliding. My ex had grabbed me and insisted we go inside. He was horrified. We didn't get much sleep that night. Eventually, the next day after calming down, we decided we wanted to go out at night again and see if anything else happens. There was a lot more that happened. I won't get into too much detail about. We saw strange UFOs and two big bright lights that appeared to be close to us. So bright that it was hard to see. That itself was very scary and unusual. But the strangest thing was the winged being or thing. After this happened, my perspective of life changed completely. There is so much out there that we don't know about. Not that it's related, but weird things started happening around the world, too. COVID, Ukraine, Chinese spy balloons, so much more. There is just so much happening. I have searched and talked to so many people to see if maybe they experienced something similar, but I can't find much information. I do believe that maybe what I saw was an angel or could be an interdenominational being. I'm not sure. I don't think I'll ever know for sure. I've accepted that. Again, as unbelievable as it sounds, this is something real that has happened to me and my ex-boyfriend. Feel free to tell me your thoughts. 
Hopefully this reaches someone who witnessed something similar. February 25th, 2016. It was a normal day and the sun was going down. I was home one night and both my mother and stepfather were home too. I assumed they were asleep. I let the dog in the backyard. I noticed it was a little warmer than usual out. Also, it was a pretty clear sky, so I went out back to stargaze. While I was outside, I felt something in the air. Some sort of static buzz, I felt it in my stomach, and it felt like my bones were vibrating. I followed the feeling and looked over the fence to see where it was coming from. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was a triangular UFO craft landing on the street in front of my house. I couldn't tell if the craft had legs or not. It had orange, purple, blue, green, red, and white lights on it. I remember thinking that it was weird nobody on my street was seeing it. I saw a door open on the craft that formed a ramp that touched the street. Baffled and babbling, I went inside, and as I rushed to the kitchen sink, I said to myself, It's not real. You're just crazy. It's not real. You're just crazy. I washed my face with some cold water and looked out of the window above the kitchen sink. I saw a little girl in an old school pink dress with blonde hair. I estimated her age at about five to seven years old, and she was holding the hand of a shadow person, leaving the craft with her. I couldn't see any details of the silhouette she was holding the hand off or inside the craft due to the bright white light. I thought it was weird how I could see the details of the girl, but not the other thing. As I saw this, I heard a little girl's voice say, Lute, come with me, Daddy. It's so good to see you, Daddy. Don't you want to come with me? But it was said inside my mind. I went from baffled and babbling to terrified and panicked to the highest degree. I left the kitchen, ran slash, and stumbled into the living room. The voice of the little girl died down. I began wondering if I was having a nightmare. I looked at the time. It was 10.33. I then thought to myself, if I was dreaming, how could I possibly know the time? I felt an approaching presence. I slowly turned around and saw a silhouette of the shadow-type man at the front door, if you could call that thing a man. I could see it through the foggy glass of the front door that still had Valentine's Day decorations on it. It had long, spidery fingers that it deliberately flaunted, as if it knew what I was seeing through the mind. It began to laugh, but not out loud in my head. As it did, I saw its mouth open and close like when a cartoon character laughs. I was shaking and trembling. I immediately tried to plan a route to my mom's room, but I decided on a shortcut that would lead me through the fireplace to the left of me and into my mom and stepdad's room. I ran to the double-sided fireplace, and as I started crawling on my hands and knees, I heard it tell me you won't escape. We've taken you many times before and there is nothing you can do. I looked at my ash, covered arms, as I tried to continue to crawl through the fireplace. I looked into my mom's room. My mother and stepfather were both lying in bed on their backs, but with their heads facing me. Their eyes were screaming. It was like they both were having sleep paralysis. The dark voice said, They can't help you. They are frozen. Then I heard the buzzing in the air turn into rumbling, and I heard a chant that sounded like the chant of a dead language. error. The chant was very repetitive, and the same syllables were chanted over and over. As the rumble intensified, a white light was washing over everything. I tried to move, but as it grew stronger, I grew weaker. It became so loud and so bright, I was blind and deaf, overloaded by too much light and too much line. Everything went white. I woke up in what seemed like a half second later, face down and tongue out on my bed, shoes on and fully clothed. My boots were on my pillow, almost as if whoever took me didn't know that it was for my head, so they placed me on my bed backwards and face down. I sat up in shock. I ran into the bathroom to check on myself in the mirror. I opened my mouth and saw that my tongue was cracked, dehydrated and dry. It was like a dead man's decaying tongue. I could peel pieces of skin off it. It was so dry. 
I washed my mouth with water until it was hydrated enough for me to talk. I remember sitting there in front of the mirror for a second, thinking about what happened. I remember thinking, how do I explain something like this? I broke down and began crying hysterically. What made it worse was if that little girl was my daughter. Would I ever see her again? Would I ever get to know her? Is she safe? Is she okay? I don't even know her name. How do I find closure in knowing a daughter I never knew I had is out there without me? And with whatever took me, how do I move on from knowing that I'll never get to see her grow up? How do I cope knowing I can't reach her and I can't help her? I practically fell downstairs to tell my mom and stepdad what happened. I knocked on their door and my stepdad answered. I was babbling, shaking and crying the story out of my mouth. But it made no difference because my stepdad said last night, I don't know what you're talking about. He closed the door. I sat on the couch in the living room and quietly cried as I questioned my sanity. It was 5, 55 a.m. Are you familiar with the Custer Battlefield in Montana? Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument. Just to put things in perspective, I'm 65 years old now. This took place in the early 90s, and I used to. I don't do it so much anymore. I used to have a Dodge van, and on vacation time, I would. Always throw a futon in the back of it, a sleeping bag, my Coleman camping stuff, and I'd hit the road for two or three weeks and go visit places. One trip, I went back east. I'm from back east. I'm from Ohio. And I've been in Monterey now for the last 40 years. And I've visited Civil War battlefields. Andy Heatham, Gettysburg, Harper's Ferry, and on one trip, I went up to see Custer's Mountain up there in Montana. And where it is, it's up there in the prairies, and it's surrounded by a lot of mountains. It is small. It's on. The intersection of State 90 and us Route 212, which goes east and west. It's a little east of Billings, Montana. And 212 starts at 90 and runs right behind Custer's Hill and goes to Spearfish Sturgis Deadwood, you know, that part of the country. Anyway, so I've been on the road for four or five days already on this trip, and I'm tired and I need to take a shower or jump in a river someplace. I get to the park at 8 o'clock at night. It's already closed, so I'm not going to go in and see the monument that night. I was also really hungry. Now down where this was at is this little general store that has a cafe in it. So I pulled in the parking lot right there, and they were getting ready to close. It was this guy and his wife, and the guy was a retired park ranger who used to take out tours of the monument, and he knew it really well. And his wife was Native American, and she lived there with her whole family for generations. And you know, after the battle, the Native Americans just didn't go away. They all still live around there in the following generation. Anyway, so they make me something to eat. And I asked them if they happened to have a beer I could drink, and they said no. They said go up the road a couple miles to this little town called Crow Agency, buy a 12-pack, bring it back, and we'll help you drink it. So I did that. I went up there and got a 12-pack, and I brought it back, and for the next couple hours, they told me the true story of Custer's battle, and it was really riveting. Parts of the story you never heard of. It wasn't like Errol Flynn dying on the hill like in the movies. It was a long, drawn-out battle, and it was multifaceted. There were other parts of the battle, other sections of the battle. Anyway, they were getting ready to close up. They had to go home. I asked them if I could camp out in their parking lot. They said, no, I couldn't do that, but there is a little access road off route, 212, about a mile down the road, and it's a dirt road, and due to maintenance of the park, you can pull into that spot, and nobody will bother you. I said, that's great. I went down the road. I found the spot, backed into it, and turned off the van. It was dark, starry, and it was quiet. And it was just out here in the prairies. It wasn't eerie at all. It was just neat, right? And it was dark, and it was starry. So I rolled back into my sleeping bag, and I went to sleep, and I was out like a light. 
So it must have been a couple hours later. I'm sleeping. I guess I'm sleeping. Maybe I'm dreaming. I'm hearing this noise. Back of my mind. Small, ethereal. I hear men shouting. I'm hearing horses. I'm hearing gunshots. I'm laying there thinking I gotta be dreaming this. You know how you're in REM sleep. You can't move, right? And it comes and it's going and it's fading and it's coming back. And it's getting louder. Now I'm waking up and I'm hearing this. You know how you wake up to a bad dream and you go, Oh my God, that was a bad dream. And it goes away. This didn't go away. It's getting louder. I'm hearing this. I'm looking at my hands. I'm awake. I'm hearing this. What is this? I throw open the side doors of the van. I jump out and there's nothing. There's nothing. It's dark. It's starry and a little cool and it's still going on. Horses and gunshots and men. I'm hearing this. Then it just started fading away. And then it was gone. The whole episode probably lasted three minutes. The whole rest of the night. I crawled back in the van. I sat there wrapped in my sleeping bag, completely spooked. The next day I went and visited the park, and then I left. But that night it was weird. I'd just like to say that I'm not making anything up. All of this 100% happened. I find it somewhat therapeutic to share information like this. Generally, people aren't very kind, and I have been laughed at and called deplorable things for sharing accounts like this. I feel these types of things are important to share so that other people who have things like this happen to them would feel less like an outcast. I am on the bashful side of the personality spectrum, so I'm definitely not seeking attention. My parents were from a small Mississippi town that has had many UFO sightings, heavy paranormal activity, cryptid sightings, and general strangeness. Maybe this has something to do with what I have been experiencing 40 miles away in a heavily populated area that doesn't have a single snooze. Hour in its operation. I don't fancy the idea of this high strangeness following me, but I don't know how else to describe it. It followed me, or should I say us? My parents moved to the city sometime in the mid-1990s and years later, I was born. The first experience I'd like to share happened around January 2012. I was attending an extracurricular mentoring program at a school, and there were hundreds of people there. We, the students, were assigned seats, and the names of our mentors were taped to a chair in each row. Unfortunately, my group's mentor wasn't there, so peers started to get up and wander around. I didn't. I just sat there and vaguely looked in the direction of the mentor speaking in front of me out of boredom. He was talking to my classmates in the row in front of me. He was their mentor. He wore glasses and had almost icy blue eyes. I was just looking in his direction, and I saw this man's eye change into a vertical pupil, like a slip, reptilian-like. I still don't believe I saw that, but why would he get nervous after that happened? He peeped at me from the corner of his eye while still addressing the students in front of me. It was a slit pupil. It was still blue, but the pupil was vertical. I kind of did a double take and slightly frowned in confusion at why I saw that. What confirmed it was that he got nervous after this. I don't think anyone else saw it, or they did, and they were like me utterly shocked and confused. Maybe he wasn't expecting me to notice because he had glasses on. Why would he look at me while his eye is like that? Perhaps an involuntary shape shift. I'm an open-minded person. However, I still take a lot of things I hear on the internet with a grain of salt until I actually experience it. Did I see what people call a reptilian shapeshifter? Why would he take an interest in mentoring a bunch of human teenagers? I don't know. What I do know is it was not normal, and if it wasn't for the hundreds of people in the auditorium, I would have run out of there. It's not creepy because he was non-human. It's creepy because he was masquerading as a human, so we wouldn't suspect anything. For the most part, I've just sort of brushed off these experiences, but at times they can become intense. 
In the midsummer of 2012, I was lying in bed and watching the TV. Literally out of nowhere, I got this vibe from the window, as if someone was staring at me. It felt horrible. My mind was telling me to run, but I just laid there in bed. I turned the TV up to cut through the feeling that had built up in my room. I faked a laugh at what I was watching on TV, because I knew something was staring at me from the window at this point. In my mind, I thought that my laughing would trick whatever was out there into thinking I wasn't paying attention to the horrible vibe it was giving off, pretending as if I didn't know it was there. Right after I faked laughing, whatever it was started to tap at the window, loudly. These were solid tap-tap like it was letting me know that I didn't fool it. The tapping was hard enough to make the window shake a little. It would scrape at the window screen as well. I could not jump out of bed and down the hall to the bathroom quick enough. I stood there in the bathroom absolutely terrified. I had to lean against my vanity to keep my legs from giving out from trembling. I sat there for about a good twenty minutes, half expecting to see something peep around the corner into the bathroom at me, and half contemplating to go sleep with my parents. I really didn't want to wake them, but I felt if I had gone back in my room that night, something bad was going to happen to me. I slept with my parents that night. It is actually hilarious when I think about it now. A giant teenager nestled between her parents in a bed. Wasn't funny while this was happening, though. I was scared out of my mind. They asked me what was wrong, and I just said I was going to camp out with them that night. I was not about to go back into that room and get abducted, eaten, or whatever. Screw that. In all seriousness, no way that was a physical person. My room is on the second story of a house surrounded by an eight-foot wooden deadbolt fence at the end of a yard. No way it was a bird, because... Birds hmm. are not usually active at 1, 2 a.m. in the morning. Plus birds, the species around here, beaks are too small to make a noise like that. It was definitely not a squirrel. I tried to recreate the noise the next day with my nails on the window, and I could not. My nails sounded too dull against the glass. I am 99% certain it was not an animal either. It seemed too intelligent and could taunt. We still live in the same house in the same heavily populated area. I don't know where it could have come from. Or where it could have gone. I'm going to be honest. The tapping at the window sounded like it came from something with developed claws. If I had to guess digits, maybe two. Five. The vibe this being gave off was not a good one, and this is exactly why I do not sit out in the backyard at night in my garden. Anymore, and I make sure to lock my window before the sun goes down. I'd like to note that this tapping on the window incident happened two times over two summers. One time in July of 2011 and the other more aggressive one in July of 2012. The one from 2011 wasn't as loud or intimidating as the latter one. I haven't experienced it after these two years. Nevertheless, high strangeness still occurs. Around late June of this year, however, I was woken at 4 a.m. by this scrubbing sound, followed by a thack sound against the walls near my room from outside. It went up the wall to the ceiling and back down and towards the window. I did not know what that was. A misguided squirrel or bird. Highly unlikely. This next experience, 2012, happened at night. Again, I was lying in bed watching the TV. Then there was this hissing that started coming from the window. It was faint, but definitely there. I was not imagining it. I still get creeped out by this. It puts me in a trance. I was staring at the window in a trance, and I could not move. When the hissing stopped, I regained my senses. It's happened multiple times. I don't like that something can have control over my locomotion like that. It continued to happen throughout the years. Just last year, around September, I was taking a shower, and out of nowhere, there was this loud hiss that originated in one of the corners of the shower, followed by a ringing tone in my left ear. I jumped because of how loud the hissing was. I'm a bit more relaxed now, but still very cautious when I take a shower. It is very uncomfortable to be aware of something that may be watching me bathe. 
In March of 2013, I was lying in bed with my eyes closed. I was not sleeping, but I was at the going to sleep state, if that makes sense. It was broad daylight, but all I felt like doing was laying down to sleep. In this state, laying in bed, eyes closed, I felt like I was being sucked through some sort of tunnel. I was conscious of myself in the bed, but I was going somewhere else, too. I was completely immobile and could feel this tingling sensation all over. At the end of this tunnel, I could see a room. But before I reached this room, I started to pull myself back. There was an instinctive nope reaction on my part, and I started to pull myself back. When I made it back, I immediately got up. I'm not sure what that was about. I also heard a voice during this incident in a monotone say something along the lines of, How can you believe in extraterrestrials and God? I know it seems so corny, but that's what it sounded like it said. I'm not sure why whoever it was would say something like that. In 2014, this is very embarrassing for me, and might be to him might, but I feel I need to share it. I started having this feeling in my private area equivalent to a large object forcing its way inside of me. It got to the point where it was disabling, and very painful, and it hurt to walk. It was a sore, throbbing pain. This would happen out of nowhere. I'd be sitting on the couch, in stant pain, laying down, instant pain. I checked myself and could not find out what the problem was. This was around the same time when I had to go to my pediatrician because of the irregular cycles I was having. I would not have a cycle for five months at a time. No injuries, no hormonal irregularities, nothing. They could not find out what was wrong with me. And then, in October of 2014, I had a dream. I'm sure it was a recollection of some sort, where I was in this brightly lit room. I had no clothes on, and I could not see where this light was coming from, nor could I see anything else. I felt very dazed. I felt my hand being grabbed and guided toward this room that had a back stretcher type chair in it. It looked like the thing elderly people used to help their backs, but silver in color with this sort of rim going around the top of it. Again, I hope this is making sense because I cannot draw. I was placed in this chair. The next thing I remember is having this needle being inserted into my right upper arm. I watched as the needle was placed there and I felt no pain. I couldn't see who grabbed my hand, nor could I see who placed the needle in my arm. I was then shown a screen on the wall in front of me where I saw my abdominal organs. I've never seen anything like that before. I woke up to a very itchy right arm that I scratched so hard. I made a sore that had never happened before. It still itches occasionally. The very next day after this dream, this life form appeared in my bathtub drain. I'm not making this up. It seemed to be some type of fungi, but it reacted to water touching it and had tendrils that swayed in the water. I was honestly creeped by it. I don't know what the heck it was. I still beat myself up for not filming it when I first saw it poking about six inches up out of the drain. I didn't want to get close to it and decided to start showering in my parents' bathroom instead until it went away. It did, but it came back in 2017 and seemed to have changed its shape, or it may be a different life form altogether. It appeared more ruffle-like with holes in it, but it stayed curled up in the drain instead of poking out. Again, everything I just typed is 100% true. I have nothing to gain for sharing my accounts other than the hope of helping others feel less like outcasts because of their experiences. For the longest time, my friend worked as a trail ranger at a large national park. A trail ranger is basically a ranger is basically a ranger, only with considerably less judicial power. He can't arrest you or anything, but if you're in an illegal blind or hunting stand, he had the power to call in actual cops before ripping down whatever unlicensed hide you've constructed. So this one time, he's accompanying an actual forest ranger and taking down unauthorized hunting cameras and feeders. The actual ranger was an older guy who started to feel unwell towards the early afternoon, so he headed back on his own. 
It was like an hour's ride on an A.B. and left my buddy to finish up. Just as he was almost done, my friend starts to hear voices coming through the trees. It's important to keep in mind that he was way, way off the beaten path at this point, so it's not like he expected there to be anyone around. But it occurs to him that these might be the people putting up the illegal cameras and blinds in the first place. He calls out to them, demanding to know who they are. But the voices just go quiet, and there's not a sound to be heard other than the occasional bird song. It's also starting to get dark by that time, so he starts heading back towards the trail where Zed Veb is parked. When he finds it and tries to start it up, it won't budge. That's when he noticed that the AD battery has been torn out and taken by someone. Not some prank by the older ranger. Someone has actually disabled his means of escape. The way he tells it, this obviously made him extremely nervous, especially since he'd already heard voices in the area. He radios back into the ranger station he's based at, basically telling them that he needed someone to come pick him up. They reply they'll have someone out to him within an hour. But when he asks about the older ranger, they tell him he hasn't arrived back yet. Again, this made him really nervous since the ranger should have easily arrived back by that point. He settled down and started a small fire as the sun went down. But before long, he heard those same voices again. They're not happy at all. He said it sounded like they were in the middle of a vicious argument, with one guy angry and yelling, while the other sounded frightened and apologetic. He listens for a minute or two before calling out into the darkness, asking if anyone needed help. The way he tells it, they must have heard him. He could hear them, so they must have heard them in return. But they didn't react like they were too absorbed with their disagreement to answer him. My friend then radios back into the ranger station for a progress report. They replied saying they were having a little trouble finding the trail he was on, but that they wouldn't be much longer. The older ranger, however, still hadn't arrived back at the station. About five or ten more minutes go by when my trail ranger friend begins to hear the same angry voices start up again. He decides to walk towards them, hoping maybe he can prevent a potential assault and maybe even get his hands on some food and water. He walked in their direction, but the voices seemed to be getting further away, no matter how much he tried to close in on them. Finally, after like twenty minutes of walking, he gave up and hiked back to his fire. It's about then that he got a radio call, and they said the older ranger guy has been found passed out, covered in vomit, having fallen off his outfit. He was being taken to the hospital, and that had taken priority over finding my friend. I mean, that's understandable, but my friend is getting kind of frustrated at this point. He's out in the woods on his own, and it's getting real chilly out. Then the voices came back. He's pretty bored at this point, and he's convinced these guys don't want any company. So he said he just sat there in the darkness, listening to them argue over something. He's picking up little phrases here and there when the voices begin to shout. Things like, well, it wasn't yours to take, or I don't care. It's mine, goddammit, stuff like that. He says he assumed it was two hunters, maybe arguing over a kill. But there was a good chance they were blaming each other for the missing equipment that my friend and the ranger had confiscated. He heard the argument get louder as one of the hunters shouted something unintelligible. Then out of nowhere, bang, a single gunshot echoes through the woods. He immediately doused his fire, ran a couple hundred meters into the trees, then hid in a thicket. He said he waited there for as long as he could stand it, hearing absolutely nothing but his own heavy breathing until he saw the lights of an at B. He told the guy picking him up everything that had happened, and they called it into the ranger station. They had people looking for three hours out there, but not a single thing was found by any of the rangers. They came back the next day with state police and tracker dogs. It only took about an hour before a shallow grave was found. In it was a, was a long dead corpse of a man who had clearly been shot in the forehead. Thing was, it was a skeleton that had been there for years and years. So either the argument he heard just ended with a bang and both parties went home last night, or he heard the murder of someone from years ago. I don't really believe the last part, and to be honest, neither does he, but it certainly makes for a creepy ending to the story.
But the really scary part for me is that there's every chance that the gunshot he heard that night was yet another murder, and that the body will be found in a similar way by some one unwary ranger, like some horrible time loop that'll never end. Many years ago now, my family and I were on a road trip going to visit Big Bend National Park down in Texas. This was way before the World Wide Web, mind you. That's important for you to know, and you'll know why in a moment. We were trying to plan where to stay, having picked up several brochures for actual ranch stays in the area at the time. There were only about three or four to begin with. We narrowed them down to two, which appeared to list the very same things. Horseback riding, it's important to note here that when we made reservations, we verified that the horses would be available during our visit when we called swimming, rooms with air conditioning. We wanted horseback riding, and there were only two that actually offered it. One was $10 cheaper than the other one, the cheaper one. We assumed was cheaper because it was further out in the country than the other one, which was right in the middle of town. We kind of liked the idea of the quiet desert. Neither brochure had any pictures, so we could only guess about this. Oh my, how we wish we had seen pictures. But first, you know how we selected it because it was further out of town. We had to take a coarsely graveled road to get to the ranch. The road was about 18 miles long, and we got an actual flat, and not just any flat. We blew a huge hole in the tire. Sure, we had a spare, but the point is that we're in the middle of the Texas desert with very little water, and it's fast approaching midday. It's actually really dangerous to be out there since you can develop heat stroke, literally, within about 20 minutes of being exposed to that kind of heat. The size of the hole in the tire meant that a patch was impossible. We also didn't know any numbers for local mechanics. So we're kind of panicking when this other truck comes rolling along. He eyes us up and down, seeing that we're city folk, and you can tell straight away he has nothing but contempt for us. He starts telling us all about how dangerous it is to be stuck out here in the desert. How quickly rattlesnake venom can kill you dead. How the vultures pick clean the bones of anything that falls victim to the elements out there. That's if the bandits or smugglers didn't find us first. The local guy sold us a new tire for, are you ready for this, $150? Yeah, keep in mind that this was about 25 years ago, so imagine how much that would be now. And it wasn't like we couldn't not buy it. We had no choice. It was literally buy the tire or face the consequences. So we paid for the tire and went on our way again. When we arrived, we gaped in horror at the scene before us. The place we chose... This cheaper one wasn't a hotel ranch at all. They were actually trailers sitting on a rocky hill. I kid you not. I'm talking mobile homes, lifted and sitting on tons of rocks on hills. Sure, they were weighted down and there was a graded edge, but you had to actually climb the rocks to get to the trailer, cabin, rocks, and you had to carefully ascend them. How a place like this ever got a business license, nor have a lawsuit filed against them, is beyond me. I guess in those days, I suppose, people weren't as sue happy as they are now, though I do remember it was getting started good. But I digress. When we checked in in the dining room, we were informed that the horses were not out for the summer yet, and this was in May in South Texas, where it's summer, nearly all year round. This after we had been told that they would definitely be available on that date. Fine. We ate our dinner in the dining room, which was at the bottom of the rock hill. We went to make our way up the hill to the trailer, and my foot slipped on a rock, and the next thing I knew, I was falling off the rocks. My ankle was sprained. Now how in the heck was I supposed to finish climbing up there to get to the room? For that matter, how would I ever go back and forth? So we finally get to the room, and I elevate my foot on the bed. I'm hot, I'm tired, and I just want to sit for a few minutes, thanking God that at least this bad day is nearly over. I turn on the TV, hoping to find something relaxing to watch. We were told that the cabins had satellite TV, which was just getting started good. Unfortunately, we could only pick up one channel. Was it any surprise then 
that the one channel we got was only in Japanese. <coughs> this was the Texas desert. I could see Spanish, but Japanese. I showed my teenage son, but he said it wasn't Japanese text. It was a language he'd never even seen before, and he's really into Asian cartoons and whatnot. The shower was completely broken. It only drizzled water in that water was scorching hot. Not useful at all. We weren't able to take a shower while we were there, and believe me, we needed to. Later we joked about it, saying that we, we felt like we were in Chevy Chase's National Lampoon's Vacation movie, where nothing goes right. It's funny now, though obviously it wasn't back then. It is those kinds of trips that create truly vivid memories. But the first night we hardly slept. There were weird noises of things moving outside the mobile homes, things sniffing and scratching in the dirt outside. It was horrible. We told ourselves it was just coyotes, but I know coyotes, and they don't make those noises. The next morning, my husband took a walk in the fields around us. When he got back, he told us to pack our bags. The horses weren't missing at all. They were all in a field about a mile out from our mobile home. All lying in a field, flies buzzing around where their corpses lay. As we left for the Big Bend area, we decided to stop in at the other ranch we'd considered. It was nauseating to discover that the place was perfect. The bedrooms were authentic looking. The beds were old Texas style beds. They came that are a large box with a mattress on it. The horses were out front. The TV worked and had high bowl. They had an amazing shower room, and the dining room had ceiling fans. Oh, my. What a mistake we had made. It would only have been an extra ten dollars. Needless to say, the lesson we learned was to never, ever, book a stay anywhere without first seeing pictures. That seems like duck advice for today, but back then there wasn't much we could do about it. In any case, it was definitely an adventure. About a year ago, I drove across the country to California for grad school. Total, the trip was about 2,800 miles, taking me across the middle of the country. I had two other options, to drive the northern route through Colorado or the southern way, through Colorado or the southern way through Alabama and South Texas. Although this was probably the most boring way, it was the fastest by about six hours. The entire trip took 4.5 days. I had recently been through a tough breakup, and things back home all around weren't going great for me since undergrad, so that played into my decision to move to California. I really enjoyed the drive itself. It gave me plenty of time to reflect on my life and figure out the stuff I needed to change about myself. I would basically drive 10, 15 hours a day until I got tired and book an Airbnb. I took my time on the drive. If I saw a cool national park landmark to explore, I did it because it was the most free I've ever felt. Anyway, I was driving through the Ozark Mountains in Arkansas. I'd never watched the show, but figured it would be a cool place to explore. I was making good time on the drive, so I took a 30-minute detour and followed the GPS on my phone to the center of the national park. I drove through a quaint town past a junkyard filled with old rusted vehicles and down a stretch of road that was covered in tall spruce trees. Eventually I lost service, but that was fine because I figured it was still a relatively frequented spot for outdoor junkies. I reached a gravel turnout marked with a wooden sign where people could take small boats to launch. I parked, locked my car, and grabbed my knife, some water, and hammock hoping to find a cool spot by the river to get a peaceful rest. I found two trees with the perfect distance and set up my hammock, drifting off into a light sleep for about 30 minutes. When I decided it was time to go, I rolled my hammock into its case and put my large knife and water into the drawstring bag I carry them in. I should add that I carry the knife whenever I go hiking because I'm a paranoid person that's seen too many movies. I grew up hunting and fishing and wrestled in college, so I normally feel fairly safe by my own. As I walked up from the river bank, I noticed a black SUV had parked and a young couple was standing behind it with the back hatch open. The guy was setting up a fishing pole and the girl was standing there just watching. I noticed a medium-sized black dog with medium-length hair. 
It looked like a lab mixed with maybe German Shepherd. My family has always had large dogs, and this one looked friendly, so the thought didn't cross my mind that maybe it wasn't. As I got closer to their car, which was parked by mine, the dog noticed me and started trotting towards me. As it got within five feet, I stuck my palm out for it to sniff. I don't know if it felt like I was a threat to the couple or what, but it instantly started barking and growling, running from its owners and back to me. As it did this, the girl just looked at it, saying nothing, and the guy just kept messing with the fishing line. After a few times of running back and forth, the dog charged at me, and I started backpedaling and yelling at it. This seemed to scare it off a little, but it kept charging and lunged at me, biting me through my shorts on my mid-thigh, breaking the skin. Thankfully, it didn't hold on or shake, but I could immediately see blood running down my leg. I had no idea what to do, and I felt terrified and also intense anger towards the couple for not calling their dog off. The guy was still playing with his fishing pole while the girl looked on with an expressionless face. After the dog bit me, it continued to do its charging back and forth. As it ran back to them, I quickly opened my drawstring and fumbled with my knife. It was a large tin blade in a black sheath. I drew it and yelled out to the couple that I would use it if I have to. Out of all the things I could have yelled to make myself seem tough, I just said, please get your dog. I guess it was all my mind could process at the time. Finally, the guy looked up and called his dog back and held it by the collar, allowing me to get in my car. I did so as quickly as possible, no one saying a word to each other. As I drove off, the adrenaline wore off, and what replaced it was pure anger. My brain was telling me that I should go back and confront the couple for being so careless about their dog viciously attacking another person. However, the logical side told me to keep driving and not look back. I know this might not seem like that big of a deal and could have been a lot worse, but imagine being 1,000 miles away from home in the remote Arkansas wilderness with no phone service. I assessed the damage once I found a safe place to pull off the road and after I regained service. Luckily, the puncture wounds weren't very deep and I had a medical kit in my trunk from when I was a lifeguard. I dressed it with rubbing alcohol and cotton gal and cotton goes and drove off. Looking back, I should have called the police or animal control because the dog could have had rabies. I really didn't even think about it at the time. I guess I was just still too shaken up. If I ever drive through Arkansas again, I'll make sure to never, ever go hiking again. Jeffrey Morgan stared absently out the wet back window of his Uncle Tim's station wagon, his mind in turmoil, his delicate chin rested in his upturned palm, and his clear hazel eyes swirled with secret worry. A green rucksack containing all of his most important possessions sat on his lap, its weight comforting like a hug. Fifteen and bookish with lank brown hair and clad in a maroon zip-up hoodie, Jeff liked to think he was smarter than the average kid, because that was the only advantage he had. He was tall and willowy, limbs too long and the polar opposite of athletic. He didn't like sports or roughhousing, and video games failed to hold his interest for very long. He wasn't like his peers, and both he and they knew it. Some picked on him, but most left him alone, totally and soul-crushingly alone. He didn't have any real-life friends, but he didn't have any real-life friends, but he did have friends online. He sometimes wrote fan fiction for a cartoon show that he no longer watched, but once loved, and through that he met a group of guys on Discord that he really got along with. They were slightly older and edgy. They laughed about Nazis and voice chat and called everyone they didn't like the N-word or the F-word. Jeff didn't really like that but it's not like they were really racist or anything. Like one of them once pointed out to him, they were teenagers rebelling against their middle-class liberal parents. So what else were they going to be but dumb and racist? Even with them, though, he sometimes got lonely. If he wasn't reading or writing, he'd start to feel his isolation the way one might feel the flu or a toothache. It was all the worse. 
because he couldn't just go out and meet people if he wanted. He was shy and self-conscious, which made meeting people hard. He sighed. Next to him, his sister Kelsey folded her arms over her chest and fixed the back of Aunt Margaret's headrest with a petulant expression. Twelve and bratty, she wore a sleeveless dress and sandals, despite the November chill in her dirty blonde hair, in a sideways ponytail that she thought made her look fashionable, but actually made her look like something from the 90s. Like him, her features were soft and her eyes light. Her pert nose was different from his pug, and her lips were just a little pointier, as they should have been. Up front, Uncle Tim fiddled with the radio, and Aunt Margaret endlessly scrolled through her iPhone. They were currently making their way through downtown Keezer, a working-class community perched on the muddy banks of the Potomac River, separating West Virginia and Maryland. Antiquated brick structures dating back to the 1880s lined the slanted streets and the spires of the stately Potomac State College building loomed high over town. Rain hissed on the pavements and traffic moved at a crawl. Jeff craned his neck to see and spotted a crumbling concrete bridge spanning the gap between states. A confused tangle of train tracks followed the shore, old tankers and rail cars sitting motionless along its length their bodies rusting like unburied skeletons in the rain. Westernport, Maryland, their final destination, lay ten miles downstream. A collection of comfortable houses, narrow lanes, and shady trees edging one of the many bends in the Potomac's course. Jeff's grandparents lived there, and now after the accident, that's where he and Kelsey would live, too. Thinking of the wreck that killed his pants turned Jeff's stomach. They were out celebrating Dad's big promotion at work. It started to rain, much like it was now, and on their way home, Dad lost control of the car. Jeff's morbid curiosity, a long-standing trait that had never served him well, got the better of him, and he looked up news reports online. The car skidded, struck the retaining wall, flipped, then burst into flames. The police said they died instantly, but Jeff wondered if they did. Or if that was just another empty platitude meant to lessen the sting, like they're in a better place. Most words of consolation are. Grown-ups tell you and each other whatever they can to ease the pain, whether they actually believe it themselves or not. People Jeff had already learned almost always prefer pretty lies to ugly truths. And if you give them a choice, like that guy in the Matrix with a red pill in one hand and a blue in the other, they'll go for the lie and clutch it like a scared little kid with a teddy bear. He was no different when you got right down to it. Uncle Tim settled for a station playing Taylor Swift and Jeff grimaced. He didn't like Taylor Swift, or most music for that matter. On the other side of the bridge, the highway curved up and out of sight. Uncle Tim turned left and followed another road matching the swollen river bend, for bend. Kelsey glared at Aunt Margaret's seat and impatiently tapped her foot. She didn't want to move to Westernport. Unlike Jeff, she had friends back home in Franklin. Her life couldn't be picked up and moved as easily as his. Sometimes Jeff envied her. You guys excited? Uncle Tim asked. He was a pair of limpid brown eyes in the rearview mirror. No. Kelsey said before Jeff could reply. Uncle Tim shrugged one shoulder at a loss for how to reply. He and Aunt Margaret didn't have kids, and they always struck Jeff as uncomfortable around them. You gotta give it time, he said. You'll settle in, make new friends, and before you know it, you'll love it there. No, I won't, she said sullenly. Jeff didn't think he would either, but he didn't like Franklin, and if his memory was correct, he didn't like Parkersburg before it. They lapsed into silence, and Jeff vacantly regarded the river, flashes of brown and white peeking through gnarled trees. A sheer rock face loomed over the highway on the right, putting Jeff in mind of ancient ruins, and the blacktop angled up with the terrain. Now the river was below, and the misty, time-worn mountains of West Virginia directly across. From here, Jeff could just make out western port in the distance, White clapboard buildings clustered among dense stands of trees. He picked out the green roof steeple of the Methodist Church on Front Street, named, presumably, because it fronts the river. A mile outside of town, a foul smell crept into the car, and Jeff's nose wrinkled. 
Kelsey sniffed the air and threw her head back with an exasperated groan. The highway wound out of the hills and hit a straightaway. A brown sign with gold writing stood on the right. Welcome to Westernport. Yeah. The smell was stronger now, burning the insides of Jeff's nose and sending his stomach rocking like the pitching deck of a ship in rough swells. He looked off to the left, and there, screened behind barren trees and a chain-link fence, was the source, the sewage treatment facility. Big boxy and drab like a prison, it sat on a rounded peninsula jutting into the river, thick white smoke billowing from its singular funnel. Kelsey pinched her nose, and Jeff breathed through his mouth. The stench produced by the plant, which treated wastewater and sewage from Westernport, Luke, and Piedmont, permeated every inch of town as inescapable as sand in the desert. Shutting windows didn't help. Spraying for breeze didn't help. Nothing helped except for getting far, far away. No matter where you went, no matter what you did, the clawing whiff of shit would forever haunt the inside of your nose. I don't want to live here, Kelsey whined. She sounded like she was going to break down crying. Uncle Tim chuckled knowingly. He and Dad grew up here, so he understood. Even so, Jeff detected a mocking inflection. He at least got to go back home to Moorfield. It's not like this all the time, he said. Only certain parts of the day. That's still too much, Aunt Margaret said and waved her hand in front of her face as if to dispel the odor. It's bracing, Uncle Tim said dismissively. Put some hair on your chest. Aunt Marigret sneered in distaste, and he erupted in hearty, not entirely good-natured laughter. In town, Westernport Road turns into Church Street. A gas station, a McDonald's, and a Dollar General crowded the left flank, and a gentle hill topped wheelhouses fell back from the right. Near the river, tumble-down row houses with dirty siding overlooked First Street, and closer, Westernport Elementary. An archaic two-story brick deal with big windows, huddled where it had since the twenties. Because of the village's cramped layout, the houses on Church Street were virtually on top of the road, front yards consisting of cracked sidewalk, or, if you were really lucky, a sliver of grass just wide enough to attract fallen leaves. A diner, a bank, a barber shop, and a hardware store gathered around a four-way intersection comprised downtown. Ahead, Church Street crossed over George's Creek, which bisects Westernport before filtering into the Potomac and slithered off into the highlands to the north. On the left, Victory Post Road entered the neighboring town of Piedmont, West Virginia, by way of a bridge with no name. Uncle Tim turned right, taking them deeper into town, and Jeff took a deep, calming breath. The sooner they got there, the sooner he'd have to start school, and of all of the things he wasn't looking forward to in the coming weeks and months, that was number one. On the very first day, he would walk in there an outsider, and everyone would know he didn't belong, that he wasn't one of them. He didn't want that. He wanted to be invisible. Victory Post Road weaved through the rest of Westernport. Jeff spotted the library, a Lutheran church, an auto shop, Big roll, top doors opened to reveal the shadowy interior of a garage, and the American Legion post 155. Just across the town limits, Uncle Tim turned into a dirt driveway wedged between two hillocks. At the top, Grandma and Grandpa's house, a squat American four-square with red siding and a pitched roof over the porch, occupied a wide clearing ringed by woodland. Smoke drifted from the chimney and warm. Inviting light shone in the first floor windows, lending the place a rustic charm that put Jeff at ease. Even if only a little, the tires spun and squelched in the sodden yard, and Uncle Tim gunned the engine to keep from getting stuck. Every time it rains or snows, this place turns into a swamp, he commented as he killed the engine. Didn't your dad say he was going to put gravel down or something? Aunt Marigret asked. Uncle Tim snorted. He's been saying that for twenty years. He opened the door and climbed out, and Aunt Margaret followed. Jeff lingered a moment, delaying the inevitable, then got out himself. Thin drops of cold rain beat down on his head and shoulders, dampening his hair and hoodie. Kelsey, arms still defiantly crossed, sat where she was, brows furrowed stormily. His first instinct was to leave her alone, 
but now that Mom and Dad were gone, he was sort of responsible for her. You coming? he asked. No, she spat. The venom in her voice was strong enough to kill a grown man ten times over. Jeff's resolve wavered, and he almost walked away. You have to, he said. Uncle Tim and Aunt Margaret stood by the trunk, Aunt Margaret with her head ducked against the rain, and Uncle Tim grabbing Kelsey's bags. I don't want to, she said. I want to go back to Franklin. He couldn't believe he was saying this. Well, thinking it, but he did too. I know, but you can't. She drew a deep breath and pushed it back out again in a savage rush. Jeff opened his mouth and reconsidered what he was going to say. Uncle Tim doesn't want us, so it's this, or an orphanage. He glanced at his uncle through the rear window, then leaned in. We don't have a choice, he said. We can't stay with Uncle Tim. I could have stayed with Uncle Tim. I could have stayed with Kendall. Kendall Kramer was Kelsey's best friend. They did everything together, from putting on makeup to talking back to the teacher, and leaving her behind hurt Kelsey more than she would ever admit. Jeff was starting to get annoyed but forced himself to be patient. Losing mom and dad was just as hard on her as it was on him, if not harder. No, you couldn't have. Her parents didn't want you living with them, but Grandma wants you living with them, but Grandma and Grandpa. That came out much, much harsher than he meant, and Kelsey flinched. Great job. You should be a counselor one day. Why, yes, little Susie. Your mommy probably does hate your guts. Me too, he quickly added. We just have to make the best of it. I don't want to either, but what else am I going to do? She turned her head pointedly away, and Jeff rolled his eyes. Whatever. Slinging his bag over his shoulder, he slammed the door and went around to the trunk. The mud sucked at his vans, and he almost stepped out of them. Grandpa had come outside and stood on the porch, a cup of coffee clutched in one hand. Tall and lanky, with white hair and a wet ear mustache. He wore a thermal undershirt tucked into dark brown trousers. His face was rugged and weather-beaten, but unlined, and his blue eyes were sharp and crystal clear. He was sixty-six, but if he dyed his hair, he could pass for fifty, maybe even forty-five. He flashed a tight smile and nodded, and Jeff nodded back. Grandpa was what the books might call a salt, all earth type. He worked at the paper mill in Lucas for 30 years, voted Democrat until they got too far left and raised chickens and pigs out back. Today only a few hens and a single rooster remain. He looked tough because he was, and he looked mean but wasn't. Uncle Tim slammed the trunk lid and, with a bulging bag in each hand, he struggled to the porch, Aunt Margaret trailing behind. Jeff glanced at the car to see if Kelsey was going to get out and when she didn't, he went on without her. Fine, he thought, be that way. What you got in there? Grandpa asked and nodded to the bags. With a grunt of exertion, Uncle Tim set them on the top step and leaned back as if to crack a troublesome muscle. Kelsey's stuff, he said. She brought everything we could fit. Because Uncle Tim only had the car, Jeff and Kelsey couldn't bring much. Grandpa was going to hire a moving truck to get the rest and bring it out. Kelsey, laboring under the delusion that whatever she didn't pack was going to be thrown in the garbage, or worse, given to charity, stuffed every single outfit, plush teddy bear, shoe, and keepsake into her bag that she could. Jeff came up the stairs to get out of the rain, and Grandpa looked at him. That all you got? He asked. Yeah, I don't bring anything else. The corners of Granda's mouth turned slightly up in one of his muted quarter smiles that you'd be forgiven for mistaking for gas. There you go, he said. A real man travels light. A real man helps his uncle with heavy things, Uncle Tim put in. Grab one of these bags, will you? Jeff picked one up and his arm nearly came out of his socket. Uncle Tim wasn't lying. It was heavy. Grandpa scurried ahead, opened the door and stepped aside. Jeff stopped, got a better grip, and fought the bag across the threshold. The living room was a pit of gloom, lit only by the blue glow of an ancient TV and the light falling in from the kitchen. The local news was on, a weatherman standing before a map of the area and chattering about low-pressure systems and umbrellas, and metal clanging sounded from the kitchen. Jeff took a deep breath through his nose, then coughed. Mothballs, old people, and rump roast. 
To his left, an armchair and a canned rocker, Book ended a wing-back loveseat with an afghan draped over the back. Framed photos dotted the green-papered walls. Knick-knacks, doilies, and ornamental plates packed a scarred oak wood hutch that looked as old as Grandpa, if not older. A broad set of oaken stairs to Jeff's right provided access to the second floor. Being careful not to knock any of the pictures down or trip on the runner, Jeff carried the bag to the top. The hall was pitch black, and he stopped to feel along the wall for the light switch. He'd been coming here every summer since he was a kid and still had trouble finding it. When he got it, dim yellow light filled the hall, chasing the shadows to the corners where they nested and plotted their return. Up here, the walls were split in two by brown chair rail molding beige paper with a floral pattern on top and wood paneling below. A vase full of artificial flowers stood on an end table in a little alcove and scuffed wood flooring creaked under Jeff's weight. The spicy scent of age seasoned the warm air and black and white photos of relatives Jeff had never met stared down at him as he passed. There were three rooms up here. Grandma and Grandpa's was at the end of the hall and Jeff and Kelsey's on either side. At Kelsey's door, he turned the knob and went inside. Back home, Kelsey had a TV and a computer in her room. Ditto, Jeff. But here the accommodations were a little more spartan. A single neatly made bed, a dresser, and a rocking chair by the window. Wine light fell through lacy white curtains and suffused the darkness. A florid landscape painting hung above the bed, and a full-length mirror took up one dusty corner. With only her phone to keep her occupied, Kelsey was going to be bored. And when Kelsey was bored, she belly aged. Leaving the bag on the bed, he went downstairs. Uncle Tim and Aunt Marigret stood in the foyer with Grandpa, and Grandma doted on Kelsey, who finally decided to join them. Grandma brushed her fingers through the little girl's hair and cooed like she was the most adorable thing ever. It's so good to see you, Grandma said. You too, Kelsey said, partly to be polite and partly honest. Grandma unhanded her and turned to Jeff. You get taller every time I see you, she said, and held out her arms. A short, rotund woman with long, messy hair the color of burnished steel and a pleasant face. She wore a red flannel shirt over a billowy black t-shirt that rustled with her movements. She believed in comfort over style and preferred men's clothing to women's because they fit better. Her hands were calloused and mannished from years of carpentry and tending the land and her arms when she wrapped them around Jeff's lithe frame, thrummed with power like high-tension wires. All those decades of chopping wood really paid off, he guessed. I'm only six, Jeff demurred. Almost as tall as your grandfather, she said. Six two, Grandpa said. He looked at Uncle Tim, who barely reached five seven. It skips a generation. Uncle Tim snorted. At least I don't have to duck under everything. You have to stretch, Grandpa said. He patted Uncle Tim's belly. Think you'd have less of this. I'm saving up for the winter, Uncle Tim said. Must gonna be a long winter, Grandpa said. After Uncle Tim and Aunt Margaret left, Jeff took his own bag to his room and sat heavily on the edge of the bed. Like Kelsey's, it was sparsely furnished with a bed, a dresser, a high boy, a wardrobe, and a desk and chair set. Jeff drew a deep breath and looked around, taking in every detail. He loved his grandparents, and their house was a place of good feelings and good memories, but he didn't want to live there. As filled with love as it might be, it wasn't home. Home was his parents. Home was his parents. Home was his parents. Home was his... Room in Franklin, home was the lax rules and minimal oversight mom and dad employed. His grandparents weren't overbearing, but they were different, older, and their ways weren't his parents. He'd just have to get used to it, though. Because his parents were dead, and from now on, this place, this town, was his life. Like he told Kelsey in the car, they just had to make the best of it, and he honestly believed that. But the question was, could he... And for that, he had no answer. Could he? And for that, he had no answer. Bed Dunham, chief of the Western Port Police Department, started Thursday morning as he did any other, with whiskey, coffee, and a visit to Faye's Danner. 
a tall, lank man with black hair beginning to gray at the temples and icy blue eyes that belied his genuine warmth. Dunham had lived his entire 43 years in Westernport and had been eating breakfast at Fay's every day since he was 15. He had been eating breakfast at Fay's every day since it was a ritual for him, and if Dunham was anything, it was a creature of habit. He woke at the same time every morning, went to bed at the same time each night, and did the same things he'd been doing for 20 years in exactly the same way. His philosophy was this, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Change isn't a bad thing, but too many people these days just aren't happy with consistency. With all the computers, Facebook, and iPhones, the human attention span had shrunk, and now everyone had eight and just can't sit still. Dunham's parents, like many of the old-timers inhabiting the hills around Western Port, were livestock farmers, simple people, with simple ways and conservative values. They went to bed at the same time every night, had dinner at the same time every evening, and watched the same TV programs every week. They rarely deviated from course, and alterations came few and far between. For example, Dunham's folks had the same living room set for 40 years. It was played, threadbare, and ugly, but comforting, too, because while everything outside changed, it, it everything else in the house remained the same, and everything else in the house remained the same, an island of stability in the shifting sands of time. He didn't always feel that way. When he was younger, Western Port bored him to tears. Outside of mudding, swimming in the river, and watching the mountains erode, there wasn't much to do. If you had a car, you could drive the 20 miles to Cumberland, where there were restaurants, a movie theater, the IMCA, and the mall. But if not, you were pretty much out of luck. As a kid, he wanted action, adventure, big cities, all the things you'd expect a rural farm boy to pine for. But he never got them. He stayed right here in town, married, joined the department, divorced, and passed his days doing his best Andy Griffith which was pretty good if he said so himself. Like the fabled town of Mayberry, Westernport was clean, polite, and safe. No one left their doors unlocked. Even Aunt Bea wouldn't do that. But if they forgot to before turning in, well, chances are nothing would happen anyway. Unfortunately, that was beginning to change. Meth production and consumption was quickly becoming a popular pastime in the area just like it was in small towns across the nation. Last year, the state police raided a house on Pine Street and seized enough meth to power a fleet of truckers for a month. And the year before that, a tweaker attacked someone at Dale's Tavern and nearly killed him. Dunham likened it to cancer. Right now, they were in the early stages, but give it time and it would spread. Another sign of the times, he supposed. Whether change was good or not, it was beginning to creep in like the rising tide, and sometimes it left him feeling lost. That made his daily visits to Fay's all the sweeter. Situated on the corner of Church Street and Victory Post Road, Fay's was housed in a converted rail car, long and narrow with big plate, glass windows, and a chrome finish. Neon letters spelled diner across the roof like a beacon to the hungry and a special board by the door. Listed all of the things you could buy inside, which wasn't much. Faye kept the menu simple and cheap. It wasn't fancy food, but it was good stuck to your ribs and didn't break your wallet. Just past eight, Dunham pulled into the gravel parking lot and frowned at the pickup truck in his usual spot. Such a small thing and inconsequential but it still nagged him as he drew alongside it and parked. His greatest flaw, his ex-wife, Jeannie said, was being opt. He liked things done a certain way, and he liked things done a certain way it ought to be. It bothered him, like a loose pebble in his shoe. He didn't see that as a flaw, but he could admit that he took it a little too far sometimes. Obviously, or else Jeannie wouldn't have left him. Shoving those thoughts away, lest they sour his mood, he killed the engine and got out. Cold drops of rain pelted his green canvas coat and mud squelched beneath his meticulously polished boots. Inside, a lunch counter flanked the back wall and booths with red vinyl upholstery lined the front. 
A Pac-Man cabinet that hadn't worked in 20 years sat next to the bathrooms, and the warm smells of sizzling bacon, frying eggs, and hash browns drifted from the order window. A fat man in a green vest and a John Deere cap with a mesh back took up one of the stools. His hairy ass crack bared to the world, and a waitress in a pink uniform refilled his coffee, then went to the window where a plate full of pancakes waited. Dunham unzipped his coat, brushed the hem behind his gun, and sat, leaving two spaces between him and the trucker. What did you say, Kurt? he asked. Kurt Fields glanced at him, then grinned when he realized who it was. Hey, Bobby, he said, cleaning up the streets. Another lifer, one who had grown up in Westernport and was fated to die there as well. Kurt drove for P.H. Anderson trucking out of Cumberland. He and Dunham went to school together and were good friends in seventh and eighth grade. They drifted apart in high school. There was no reason, no bad blood, no umbrage. It just happened. Not on an empty stomach, Dunham said archly. Dunham said archly. The waitress came back, grabbed a mug, and sat it in front of Dunham in one fluid motion, as though she had been doing this for thirty-five years. To be fair, she had. Tall, with bushy blonde hair streaked through with gray Maud Anson, was like Faye's itself, a permanent fixture by which you could set your watch. Deep lines radiated from the corners of her mouth and eyes, and her skin had gradually taken the appearance of cracked leather. She had to be in her sixties, but Dunham didn't know and had never asked. It's not polite to ask a woman her age. Morning, Bob, she said, and filled the cup. Morning, Maud. Usual, Dunham mulled that over a moment. Creature of habit, though he may be. He did enjoy occasionally mixing things up. Normally, he had an egg, sunny side up, two strips of bacon, two sausage links, and a piece of white toast, lightly burned. It was good, it filled him up, and that's all that mattered to him. These days he was starting to think Jeannie was right. You're too predictable, she huffed once, it's irritating. In his defense, Jeannie was one of those people who fetishized leaving their small town. When they first started dating in high school, they both wanted to get the hell out of Westernport, and some evenings they'd park on Prospect Hill, lay in the bed of Dunham's battered hand. Man Ford and gaze up at the stars while talking about all the places they wanted to go. Dunham eventually grew up and got practical. Jeannie didn't. She was a near forty-year-old woman with stars in her eyes and still dreaming of New York City, as though it weren't an overtaxed anti-cop hellhole. She hated the mundane and the predictable, and unfortunately he was both of those things. Maud was looking at him funny and he sighed. Switch out the sausage for grits, he said. Nodding, she jotted his order down in her notepad, ripped it out, and stuck it to the wheel. While he waited, Dunham sipped coffee and went through his mental to-do list. The dining room filled by degrees until every seat was taken, and the roaring din of three dozen voices talking at once choked the air. Willie Harper, Western Port's resident drunk, sat on Kurt's left and conversed with Dan Strode, the minister tall and willowy with a shock of white hair, an unkempt beard and perpetually bleary eyes. Wiley was the janitor at the high school before he hurt his back and went on disability. For nearly ten years he'd been cashing other people's tax dollars and drinking himself stupid. Dan, short and pudgy with glasses and a combover, had conducted every burial, marriage, and baptism in Western Port since George Bush Yard was president. After eating, Dunham laid a twenty down on the counter and left. The rain had slackened, and a chilly breeze washed over him. He zipped his jacket up, ducked his head, and went to the car. Behind the wheel, he started the engine, backed up, and swung right. A truck hauling timber blasted by on Victory Post Road, and Dunham's eyes went to the rusted chains keeping the logs together. Ever since Final Destination too, those trucks made him nervous. All it took was one weak link and bomb, Armageddon and downtown Westernport. Turning left, he drove the three blocks to the police station, a modern brick and glass building on Church Street with a blue awning over the door. He parked in the side lot, cut the engine, and got out. 
In the lobby, he wiped his feet on the carpet and shook himself dry like a fussy dog. Tammy Ridd, the secretary dispatcher, sat behind a counter shielded from the public by durable plexiglass, her plain face buried in paperwork. A man-sized door to its right provided access to the squad room, and Durham went through. Cluttered desks dotted a wide, tile-floored room, and metal filing cabinets stood sentry against dingy white walls. Billy Norton, the station rookie, got up from his terminal and carried a sheet of paper over to the fax machine. Tall and thin with blonde hair, his brown uniform fit him perfectly, but still seemed somehow too big as though he were a kid playing dress-up and not a real cop at all. The illusion was strongest when he laughed. Mike Van Scoy came out of the break room with a styrofoam cup of coffee and took a long, languid sip, looking for all the world like a man who wasn't on the clock. A ten-year veteran of the force, he was Billy's opposite in every way, short, olive-complexioned, and cynical to the point of parody. Crime wasn't ubiquitous to Westernport the way it was to larger towns, but listening to Mike talk, you'd think he'd seen everything from serial killers to terrorism. In actuality, the worst thing he ever saw was Dunham's lip settled into a sour frown. Morning, Chief, Mike said. Morning, Dunham said. Mike fell in next to him. Mike fell in next to him. Anything exciting happened. Mike worked the overnight shift along with Gavin Holmes. Just Craig Donner beating his girlfriend up again. Dunham made a disgusted noise in the back of his throat. Every town over a certain size has its designated bad boy, and Craig Donner had been Western Ports since he was 15. A few years older than Dunham, he started small, egging windows and fighting, then graduated to theft, assault, and manufacture and sale of meth. Willie Harper might be the town drunk, but Craig Donner wasn't far behind, and whereas Willie was a happy drunk who didn't bother anyone, Craig got mean. In the nearly twenty years Dunham had been with the department, he ran Craig in on thirteen different occasions, five of them for slapping his girlfriend, Candy, around. Is he in a cell? Dunham asked. There were ten holding cells in the basement, all of them empty as of yesterday afternoon. Mike shook his head. Nah, Candy begged me not to, so I left him. That was Candy, all right. When Craig got liquored up and started hitting her, she called, and when it came time to put him in the back of the car, she went to pieces. Dunham didn't believe in victim blaming, but Candy had every opportunity to get away from Craig and be done with it, but she never took it. Hard to feel sorry for someone being bitten by a rabid dog when they refuse to leave its kennel. Anything else? Dunham asked. No, sir, Mike said and took a sip. All right, you can go home. Mike nodded and rushed off, and Dunham went into his office. A small but tidy space with blue carpet, white walls, and a large oak desk that gleamed in the overhead lights. It was an oasis of order and stability and here, surrounded by plaque certificates and commendations from the state, some signed by the governor himself. Dunham found the piece that he had long missed at home. Sitting, he powered on his computer, then slipped a glossy photograph from the desk center drawer. A pretty girl, about sixteen, smiled up at him, her blonde hair spilling over her shoulder like waves of wet, and her crystal blue eyes still like mountain lakes. The atmosphere darkened with tension, and Dunham's lips screwed up in a puckered grimace. Veronica Nicely was three weeks shy of her seventeenth birthday when someone killed her in September. Her body was found in a farmer's field west of town. She was fully clothed and face down, arms and legs splayed like the broken appendages of a discarded mannequin. Her chest and stomach had been slashed with razor-sharp talons, and her entrails fell onto the ground with a sickening wet plop when the medical examiner turned her over. Shedded fur assaulted her tacky skin and the ground around her. Dunham concluded that she was attacked by either a large dog or by the wolves who lived in the surrounding hills. Then the me found the bite marks on her legs and inner thighs. They were human. Later on, the M.E. ascertained that the other wounds were made with a razor, not claws. 
they're too clean, he said, and traced one with his gloved pointer finger. Claw marks are messy. They tear the flesh. These are clean and precise. The killer wanted to make it look like an animal attack and did such a good job it fooled Dunham. If it weren't for modern forensics, they might have gotten away with it. In the near two months since, Dunham had been following leads, asking questions and compiling evidence, of which there wasn't much. Veronica was pretty popular and kind. She never got into trouble, didn't have a boyfriend, and didn't drink or use drugs. At first, Dunham surmised that she was known to the killer, but by now, he had to admit that it was probably random, the work of an itinerant killer just passing through, here and gone like a shadow in the night that nagged him. Having a cold case on his hands triggered his octi and left him feeling restless, thinking of her. A bright and vivacious girl with a promising future snatched rudely away. Pissed him off. Her killer was out there right this very second while she lay under six feet of dirt in Mount Carmel. The unfairness of it all weighed down on Dunham's shoulders, and if he wasn't careful, it would start to consume him. We'll find him, he promised, and the croak of his voice in the silence disturbed him. This was one of his daily rituals, soothing in its monotony. At this point, he didn't know if they'd catch her killer or not, but as long as he was out there, Dunham had hoped. Returning the photo to the drawer, Dunham logged on to his computer and started his day. So this happened my freshman year of college. I currently am working as a park ranger, and I absolutely love my job. However, the classes I took in college were no walk in the park, no pun intended. Basically, it was all environmentally focused classes, as you would expect for the career I was aiming for. And I did enjoy most of the classes I took. However, some of the classes seriously made me reconsider my major and entire career path. One of these classes focused on river water. The college I attended was very small and heavily focused on literature and environmental science. The college sits along a river. It's truly beautiful, and I often miss my four years there. They don't lie when they say college goes by fast. Anyway, one of the buildings at my college was a newly built, totally eco-friendly environmental building. It was used to study the river and the water that made up the river. Very important work, but very tedious in my opinion. One night I had procrastinated as usual, and I realized that I had to finish a paper on the effects of rainwater on the river. We had recently had some massive storms come through, and the river swelled to massive sizes and almost flooded the little college town I called home. Luckily, that didn't happen, but our professor thought this would be a great opportunity to see how the rainwater after a storm can affect the river. So I rolled out of bed, told my roommate Jake where I was going, and made my way outside. As I stated before, the college is very small, like you can get from one end of campus to the next, and like five if you walk fast enough. So I began walking in the direction of the environmental building. Night was falling. I'd say it was like six, forty-five or so. I got to the building, took off my messenger's bag, took out my laptop and folders, and got to work. I won't bore you with the details of measuring the effects of rainwater on a river, but basically it entailed me collecting water, bringing it back to the lab, bringing it back to the lab, and running tests on it until I wanted to die. It's a long process and very boring. As I had begun to type up my findings in my laptop, I heard a crash from somewhere in the building. I shot out of my seat and looked around my shoulder. I was definitely the only person in the building when I came in. I would have known if someone had come in as well, because the door has one of the beeping mechanisms that alerts everyone that someone entered. As I waiting, I heard another crash, this time sounding closer. It sounds as if someone is slamming their first into the glass cabinets that line the walls in the main part of the building. These cabinets are full of unique trinkets that have been found in the river. Some of that stuff was super valuable, and so at first I thought this may be a robbery. I sat there, one hand still, hovering over my laptop keys, considering my options when I see a head peek out. It's looking straight into the lab I'm currently in. 
I just about pissed my pants and I screamed. Out from the doorway stepped the old man. He had to be about 75 years old. He was wearing pajamas and his thin patches of gray hair and wild eyes gave him the look of a deranged person. I then took notice to the massive shard of glass in his hand. It had clearly cut into his hand as blood was pouring down it and dripping onto the floor. He raised the shard of glass, and only then did I realize the true gravity of the situation. What I did next I still regret, but it may have saved my life. I chose fight over flight and ran at the man. I think he wasn't expecting this, and so just as he raised his hand with a glass, I threw a massive overhand right that cracked loudly on the old psycho's jaw. I felt bone crack and saw two teeth go flying. I also felt the glass make connection with my cheek and immediately felt the warm gush of blood as it cascaded down my cheek. The man crumpled and I stood panting for a good minute before I composed myself and called the cops. They arrived on record time, not like much crime goes on in the town anyway, and they took the man away in cuffs after he was conscious. They took my statement and called an ambulance for me. I got my cheek stitched up and later found out the man was taken to the same, or I was at. I still have the scar where that man cut me, but I don't mind. I later was told that the man was suffering from some sort of illness, I'm guessing some form of sundown syndrome or dementia. I do feel a little guilty for cooing the old man, but I was in a life or death situation. That man could have easily seriously harmed or killed me if he wanted to. Anyway, that's probably the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. I've experienced some wacky things as a park ranger, but nothing that tops the pure fear I felt in that moment. Now it's just a cool story to share. Thanks for sharing, and please stay safe. You never know what danger lurks right around the corner. My partner and I were bored one night while we were hanging out, so we decided to drive up the mountain in the middle of my town and spray paint one of the outlooks. This particular outlook has had teenagers spray painting it since the early 80s, and we thought it would be fun to be part of a kind of tradition. The mountain we were driving on had a watchtower that park rangers would watch for forest fires in. This tower hasn't had an actual watchman in it for decades. I've climbed it a couple times, and the view from up there is gorgeous. Behind the watchtower was a little graveyard, where watchmen that died on duty were buried. My partner and I get out look and hop out of the car. The sun had just gone down, but you can see the silhouette of the watchtower looming in the distance through the dim light. I stared at it for a while, a feeling of dread building in my gut. I can't seem to look away from it until my partner touched my arm, and I kind of snap out of it. Babe, are you okay? I shake my head a little bit, trying to shake the feeling of dread. Yeah, just a little sleepy. I'm all right. We spray paint a couple things on the mountain face, like our names, and of course I painted a penis somewhere on there, and we decide to go back down and get something to eat. We get in the car, and my partner is looking out the window when they saw a tall, thin figure on top of the cliff above us. They said it was a little taller than the trees, and when they looked at it, it ducked down and hid. I'm from Oklahoma, and was raised in a town primarily inhabited by full-blooded Cherokees. So I know that when you see something like that, you do not look for it. You do not talk about it, and you pretend it's not there. I hear them go, what the hell is that? I didn't see what they were looking at, but I could feel that sense of dread in my gut again. I can see them trying to get a closer look, so I pull them over by their arm and whisper, Don't. I'm not a very serious person, so they understand that this is bad, and they immediately fall silent and stare straight forward. I turn on the car and I start driving us back down the mountain. I'm driving for a little while, holding my partner's hand, when I can feel a presence in the back seat behind me. I hear a growl and feel breath on the back of my neck. I glance up for a second into the rearview mirror just as my headlights shine on a road sign, barely lighting up the back seat. Then I see him. There was something sitting in my back seat. It was human shape. It was a kind of bruised, reddish purple color, and the scars on its skin made it look almost like a burn victim. 
Its lips were gone, leaving its bright yellowish teeth visible. It had no nose, and its eyes were sunken sockets with little glowing yellow orbs. I saw him for a split second and tried not to gasp, but my grip on my partner's hand tightened. Are you okay? They asked me quietly. I didn't want to scare them, so I just said, Yeah, fine. We keep driving, and I didn't look in the rear view at all, but I knew he was still there. I could feel his raspy breath on the back of my neck. I was tense the whole time, but stayed as calm as I could. We get into town and drive under a street light, and I pluck up the courage to look back in the rear view. But he wasn't there. He was gone. I breathe a sigh of relief and relax. My partner notices and relaxes too. We don't say anything the rest of the drive home. When we get to my house, we go to my room and sit on my bed. I tell them about what I saw and watch as they turn ghostly white. That's exactly what I saw in the trees. My younger sister came home from work and we told her what happened. That's when she reminded us that there's a graveyard up there by the watchtower. I've done a little research, and there was a wildfire up there that killed a watchman, and they buried what was left of him in that graveyard. Apparently, he's still up there, watching over the mountain. I've been up the mountain several times after this, and only saw him one more time while I was spray painting again. So every time I go up there, I make sure to be very respectful of the mountain, because I know them, because I know that he's still up there watching. About five years ago, I was on the run from the police. I had a warrant out for my arrest at that time for some charges that I just didn't want to face. The cops were coming to my mom's house constantly, so I decided to stop going home. Now my only job at the time was selling drugs. My brother and was on the run as well, and him and his gaff were living in a tent and made it look easy, so I decided to move into the Canyon W them. I was with my girlfriend as well so it really wasn't too bad, honestly. We had a spot deep in the canyon that was so well hidden, even the ranger didn't find it. I sold my car because the cops were looking for it, so we had some extra money, but we had to walk far to the store to get food. When we would go up to the store, we would mingle with some of the other homeless people to network and to make money to survive and support our habits. This is how we ran across Danny. Danny was the first person we met in the area. He introduced us to a lot of the others, which helped us make money. We really needed, so we befriended him. One day, Danny found out that his spot had been raided by the park ranger, and everything he owned had got thrown out. Well, we felt bad for him, so for some reason I offered to help him, a stranger, by letting him move into an extra tent that I had found recently, right by where we rested our heads every night. Yeah, I wasn't thinking right back then. My brother was the one who was really selling drugs. I was just doing it enough to survive. He had been doing it as basically his profession for years. My brother has done a lot of prison time, and he carried a gun, and we live in San Diego, California, where the gun laws are very strict, so the average person isn't going to be strapped, so maybe that made me feel safer. Either way, like I said, the guy was homeless and seemed harmless. He was a meth addict and would do anything we asked him to do, basically for a bowl of meth, so he all thought may come in handy. I walked him down to his new spot and showed him the ropes with getting in and out of the area, where to go to the bathroom, and we showed him what was off limits, like my brother's area and ours. The first week things went over. We didn't have any complaints, and my brother was using him to run errands for him, like deliver sacks up to the shops, and to buy snacks from 711 at midnight. Basically all things that required walking far distances. In fact, he became the official camp bitch, but he didn't mind because he had all the meth he could dream of, which I realize now is what probably caused the issue we were about to face. So one morning we get a visit from our fellow homeless neighbors, who we hardly knew. They came by my brother's tent early and asked him some questions. When they left, I asked him what they said, and he said that mostly they were asking about, mostly they were asking about me. They were basically wondering if I was a thief because they thought they heard somebody wandering around their tent the night before. My brother said that he assured them that we were not that sort of people. 
and that although we were homeless, we had plenty of money and were not going out looking to basically shit where we eat. When my brother told us about what the neighbors said, it definitely crossed all our minds that it could have been Danny, so we reminded him not to go near the neighbor's area, just in case he had accidentally walked over there. He said, of course, and that he wasn't a thief, and he wouldn't disrespect us that way. Well, fast forward another week, and strange things were happening throughout the week. For example, one day somebody dropped a bag full of lotions and lubes on the path to our spot, which definitely set off some alarms, because nobody goes in the canyon that way besides us. Again, our spot was very secluded, which is why we picked it. And also, I could tell somebody had been around the bushes near our tent, because a lot of them were smashed in, like somebody had been standing on them. On Stubby again, we asked Danny about both situations, and he denied both. Then the next morning, the neighbors came back, and they were very upset this time. They said that somebody was definitely outside their tent again that night, and not only were they in their area, but they were watching them while they were being intimate. And no offense to them, but they are not the most attractive couple. I honestly could not imagine how someone could do such a thing. We told them we would have our eyes peeled, and we were noticing prints by our tent as well. Obviously, all signs pointed to Danny again. So immediately I went to his tent to go talk to him, but he wasn't there. We waited, and even by night, he still wasn't back. That made us even more suspicious, especially because my brother had a lot of work for him that he had already paid him to do, and my brother isn't the guy you want to break a promise to. Well, it got dark, and eventually me and my girl went to sleep. In the middle of the night, she got up and went out to use the bathroom. Then about 30 seconds later, I hear her yelling, so I run outside my tent, and I ask her, what is the matter? She said she saw Danny. He was hiding in the bush and watching her pee. She almost peed all over herself, trying to pull her pants up. I was furious. I immediately went to find him. I saw him running away from a distance, so I ran back to my tent and grabbed my pellet gun and ran back after him. I chased him around the canyon for about an hour. I kept hearing him, but couldn't see him. I would chase him, and then I would hear his footsteps stop, and I would look around with my flashlight, and then, after a few minutes, I would hear running off in another direction and chase him again. Finally, I lost him at one point, which is when I decided to go to his tent. I opened it up, and there he was. He was laying in it, breathing heavily but pretending to sleep. I told him, you're lucky my brother is asleep, but I promise you if you're not out when I get up in the morning, you're going to deal with him. He swore he was innocent, but I wasn't hearing any of it. The next morning, I immediately went back to his tent, and he was still there. I told him to leave in five minutes, or my brother would be back there to make him move. So about an hour later, I see that he hasn't packed anything, so I get my brother, and my brother brings his magnum revolver. My brother walks up, unzips his tent, and put his gun directly in his face. Danny looks like he's going to cry. I said, get up, Danny. He gets up, and he starts begging. Please don't shoot me. Just let me get my stuff. But my brother says, no, you had a chance to get your stuff and leave, but now you're just leaving. He asked my brother, what about the tent? He says, that is not your tent. It could have been if you would have listened and left peacefully, but now it's my tent. My brother then yells, go now, and he shoots a shot off in the air. Danny screamed and ran for his life. Me and my brother packed up his stuff and gave it to another homeless guy under the condition he didn't stay anywhere near our area. We saw Danny a few more times here and there at the shops but he wouldn't acknowledge us just as we instructed him to do. Later that year, me and my brother ended up getting arrested and finishing our time. We both got off of drugs as well. We're going on three years clean now, and we both changed our lives around and haven't had to live in a tent again. Also, me and my girl are still together to this day. That experience, along with going to jail, has humbled all of us a lot, and we don't take for granted what we have. We're all very open-minded, and don't ever judge homeless people and try to help them whenever possible.
I used to work as a park ranger at a well-known, frequently visited national park. At this particular national park, there was an old ghost story that the veteran rangers used to tell about one of our number who heard a noise coming from a lake one day. The noise had apparently sounded like a puppy yelping and splashing, but the ranger who heard it couldn't swim and wasn't about to put himself in danger of drowning just to save a dog. The next day, the body of a young child washed up on the shore. It was never a dog out there. It was a child that had fallen in the lake after being out there exploring unsupervised. The ranger was devastated. His spirit crushed that his selfishness had resulted in the death of an innocent child. He was haunted by the thought, took to drinking, wore himself down until one night, while sleeping in his cabin, he heard a familiar noise coming from the lake. It was the sound of a little boy crying out to be rescued. He ran to the lakeside, dived into the water, and struggled his way into the center of the body of water until he reached the site of the splashing. But there he only saw the smiling, bloated corpse of that same little boy who dragged him beneath the lake and dragged him beneath the lake and drowned him, just as he had. That's the way the story went, and to be honest, I thought it was the biggest load of bull I'd ever heard in my life. I told the crusty old-timers that same thing, that I'd have to be of diminished capacity to believe a crock of bullcrap like that. But instead of laughing or whatever, like, okay, maybe this guy isn't as dumb as we first thought, they got all pissy about it. They told me not to disrespect the angry spirits of the departed, but then it was my turn to laugh. I could tell the difference between them getting annoyed over me disrespecting the dead or whatever, and them getting annoyed over me just disrespecting their dumb stories. The following week, I found I'd had my shift pattern switch to nights. I confronted them about it, told them I was not impressed that they were that immature as to switch my shifts up. But they insisted that it was only cover for a guy whose mom had taken ill and had been forced to drive back to his home state in order to care for her. I didn't believe a word of it, and I was just straight up angry at that point, angry that a pair of grown-ass men would lie about something like basically just a gaslight me. But I didn't want to show them how frustrated I was. I'd just take their crap on the chin, so to speak, and not give them the satisfaction. So the first night I'm there in the lakeside cabin, I'm settling in to prepare for a long night of utter boredom, brewing coffee and playing dumb mobile games. When I hear something from outside the cabin, I'll put down my phone, get up and walk over to the door to open it up so I can listen out for what it is. But I recognize it instantly. It's the sound of splashing coupled with the sound of a child crying out for help between spluttered breaths. Ha ha! Dickheads! Very funny! I remember shouting out into the darkness. Think you can scare me with your dumb stories? Well, I didn't believe them then, and I don't believe you now. Try it, someone with an AK as low as yours. This was obviously their little game playing out. Their attempt to scare me into submission and believing their backward-ass ghost story. But I wasn't about to let that happen. I went back inside, slamming the door shut and jamming my AirPods in on full volume to block the noise out. They were selfish, vindictive bastards. That's what I told myself anyway, but apparently not determined enough to keep playing that sound from whatever speaker system they'd set up around the cabin. Because when I paused my music like 20 minutes later, the noise was gone and all was quiet again. The next morning, just after sunrise, I pack up my stuff and prepare to leave the cabin. I was so exhausted and irritated by the prank they pulled, I wasn't prepared to wait for them to arrive. I figured if I did, I'd be so angry at seeing them that I might have knocked some of their goddamn teeth out. That would get me fired. And I simply could not afford that, not with the economy in the state that it was. But as I'm walking to my truck, something catches my eye from the lakeside, something small and sodden that the gentle waves of the lake lapped against. I turned to look and saw what it was, and when I did, I dropped my bag in pure horror and disbelief at what I was staring at. It was the body of a child, face down in the dirt. I pulled out my phone, dialed 911, and basically screamed at the operator for an ambulance to get out to the place I was based at. They had to send a helicopter in the end. 
but before it showed up, the two crusty old rangers rolled up in their truck, and their goddamn eyeballs almost fell out of their head when they saw me trying to perform CPAR on the dead kid. I tried, and I tried, and I tried, but he was gone, long gone, and it was all my goddamn fault. I ended up word vomiting about what had happened the night before, telling them everything, how I'd thought the whole thing was part of a prank, part of the punishment for not believing their goddamn story. They claimed to have no idea what I was talking about, which angered me even more. But when they asked me why I didn't help the kid, I flipped. I rushed one of the older guys, tackled him, and beat the living hell out of him before I was dragged off and talked me back down to earth. But I couldn't ever really calm down, not until the chopper arrived and put that kid's body on a stretcher. The paramedics seemed furious. There was no one to save. I remember one of them explicitly shouting over the din of the rotor roads that the kid's been dead for hours. When they took off and I drove back home to go on indefinite paid leave, I thought that might have been the end of it, and that I'd have the time and space to get over what had happened. But I didn't have time. Someone leaked information on what had happened. I don't know if it was the old-timer I deck, the other ranger, or the paramedics, but somehow someone got a hold of my contact details and the threatening calls began. I'll never forget the night my girlfriend answered the phone in our apartment, saying hello in that happy, chirpy way she always used to. I watched as her face went from all smiley to neutral to downright horrified, who is this? Hey, who the hell is this? Call here again, and I'm calling the cops. It was the first of many death threats. The first of many, many calls, handwritten letters and emails that told me I was an awful person, that I didn't deserve to live, that I was dead to the world the night I let that poor, the night I let that poor, innocent young boy drown in that lake. When his lungs filled with water in the death spasms racked body, he wasn't the only one to die. I died, too. Needless to say, she wasn't my girlfriend for much longer, and I don't even blame her. There aren't many people who could handle that kind of abuse, and I only got through it myself by the skin of my teeth. And so that led me to where I am today. I live alone in a state far, far away from the national park where I allowed a child to drown. I legally changed my name, changed my entire look so no one from my old life would be able to recognize me. I went through an intense period of transformation. The old me is a ghost, as good as dead, dust in the wind, and no one will ever find me. No one. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.